All right, well, I see we're at 1.30, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Just wanna make sure again that, um, Andy, can you just verify that you're able to hear me okay? Yep, sound good. All right, thank you. So welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our What's New in Crop Load Management webinar. For those that do not know me, my name is Mike Bazow and I'm an extension tree fruit specialist with Cornell's Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. So on behalf of the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program and the Lake Ontario Fruit Program and New York State IPM, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before we get into the talks, I do just want to go over a few housekeeping items with you. We do ask that you remain muted and have your cameras off when our speakers are presenting, just so that we're able to conserve computer bandwidth and just so it's a little bit less distracting for our presenters. So on your screen, if you're new to Zoom, you should be able to hover near the bottom of your screen and you should see the mute and unmute button. It should look like a microphone. So again, just be sure that you're muted and that your video is off. And if you do have questions for the speakers as we go through, uh, hopefully we'll have time right after their presentations to get your questions answered. But we also do have time built in to the end of this meeting to also get your questions answered during a Q&A session. So as questions do come up, you can go ahead and enter them into the chat box, which again, you can find on that toolbar by hovering over near the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and pop your questions right into there. That would also be the best place to let us know if you have any technical issues, if you can't see the screen, if you're having trouble hearing anyone, go ahead and type it in there and we will assist you as best as we can. Please note that we are recording this meeting and we will be sending out an email following today's meeting with the recording link, along with PDF slides of the presentations and we'll likely get that out sometime next week. So here's the agenda for the afternoon. Our main objectives for this afternoon are, are really to familiarize you with the different thinning tools that are available on the new NUA website, to discuss the principles of precision pruning and what that may look like within the next few years, and also to discuss some of our research results from some of our thinning trials on products like ammonium thiosulfate, metametrin, and Exceed. I do wanna point out that we do not have any DEC credits for today's webinar. So we don't have to worry about uh, filling out any of those forms or, or clicking on any of the links in the chat box today. So thank you for joining us and enjoy the presentations. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll invite our first speaker to share his. Our first speaker is going to be Dan Olmsted. Dan is the NUA coordinator with New York State IPM. He maintains and promotes NUA and works with researchers and growers to develop insect and plant disease digital forecasting tools for real-time agricultural management decisions. Dan, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, just confirming everybody can see my slide and that you can hear me. Looks good, Dan. All right, great. So uh, thank you for inviting me today. I'm gonna start right off by sharing a link in the chat box with everybody uh, that you feel free to browse as I'm talking because my goal today um, is to bring everybody's comfort level uh, up another notch with the NUA 3.0 platform. Um, many, if not all of you saw that we were in a transition last year uh, from the old website to the new. Uh, a lot has been going on since then um, to make sure that we have a smooth rollout for the 2022 growing season. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, pollen tube growth model, and I'm going to go over some of the nuts and bolts of that after uh, I give you a higher level overview of what we can do to support you and you know maintain that comfort level going forward. Um, and then other folks such as Dr. Robinson are going to talk about other aspects of the NUA 3.0 platform and how they combine with other approaches that we take for uh, crop load management. <clears throat> so uh, I'm an extension associate with New York State Integrated Pest Management. Um, and I just wanna say right off the bat that uh, NUA or the Network for Environment Weather Applications is made possible because it's part of this program. It's certainly not a standalone um, uh, effort. It, uh, a lot of different people from across uh, the spectrum within the Cornell system make these things possible. And you're really gonna see that today 
Um, we've got the researchers and the extension folks coming together um, on the technology side uh, near CIPM. Uh, and then also I'll add that the Northeast Regional Climate Center is another key partner. So all the data we are actually using to inform these very useful models, it's all managed uh, through a collaboration with that group. So with that, I'm gonna get started. So um, right off the bat, if you haven't already been on NUA this year, uh, nua.cornell.edu, um, I encourage you to visit it because it's a completely different experience than uh, what we've had in place since 2006. Uh, my predecessor, Dr. Juliet Carroll, myself um, worked very, very hard the past four years uh, with the development team, again, at NRCC, um, and uh, as well as folks in uh, computer science down in Ithaca, uh, to really give uh, a positive user experience, to add some new features uh, that make it easier to navigate and uh, remember information and things like that. So this first slide is really just pointing out the fact that NUA is a website, but it behaves like an app. So one of the first questions I always get is, oh, is there a NUA app that I can download? We made a strategic decision a couple of years ago as we were developing this to go with a website format that is what we call responsive. So on your desktop, you're gonna see something like is displayed on the left-hand side of your slide here. If you were to go onto your smart device or even a tablet, you're gonna get a different experience. Everything is still available there. So when we're talking about the pollen to growth model or carbohydrate thinning um, on a phone, it's gonna look a little bit different and it's organized in such a way um, that all the features are still there. It just makes it easier to use on a smaller screen. So to that point, um, and you'll see that I'm really gonna do this in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm really cutting to the chase. So if you're on a smartphone and you wanna use a model um, to access those important elements or functions on any given part of our website, you're gonna see what we call the little hamburger menu in the upper left-hand corner. It's really important to remember this because if you uh, forget that's there, it's gonna seem like the model is not working the way it should uh, and it could create some frustration. So just remember that. The other thing I wanna point out um, is whether that is open or closed. On a smart device, it might be harder to see that there are actually scroll bars. So you can click and drag and move up and down through all the different parts of a given web page, um, however you normally would in a browser on your smartphone otherwise. So I just wanted to point those out very quickly as well. In terms of recommended browsers, uh, if you worked with us last spring, we had what we were calling a beta or a test website going. And at that time, we said to only use Chrome because we were still in development. However, since October uh, of last year, we have had the full site up and running and we have gotten a lot of really good feedback um, we actually have had some good stress tests on the, on the website and everything is working really well. So at this point, uh, I'm comfortable saying that you can pretty much use any one of these four uh, popular browsers moving forward. Um, if you do run into some problems, uh, and I'll get into this in the next couple of slides, we have uh, communication channels back to myself and uh, the NUA platform uh, so that you're not hanging out there all alone. Before I get to that, though, uh, I just want to cover some best practices that I've come up with uh, for, this, for this online uh, resource. So best practice number one is that NUA is intended to supplement knowledge and expertise that is shared by our extension professionals and, and researchers. Um, I have grape on here. It should say Apple. But the point is uh, that NUA is not this big AI autonomous uh, robot. It is really meant to telescope and magnify and extend the effects uh, of, of what we do in extension and applied research. Best practice number two, um, always remember that you should have a very broad and well-informed IPM uh, strategy. So the NUA platform, uh, you know, we hope it's really good, but it should still be one tool in your IPM toolbox. You never wanna make a decision in isolation. So, you know, the NUA models will do their best to predict a situation or a risk factor in your orchard. But if it doesn't look quite right, you know, verify what it's saying. That's when you reach out to Mike or you reach out to your local extension professional and say, hey, NUA is saying this, but, you know, can we just have a few minutes to go over it and make sure 
uh, I'm, I'm taking the right approach forward. And then finally, best practice number three is with NUA 3.0, ask for help early. I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a moment, but this should not be something where you spend more than five or 10 minutes trying to figure something out. If you are, don't hesitate, reach out to us. We probably have the answer for you. Um, we're really on top of things so far this spring and we wanna make sure we maintain this momentum going forward into uh, April and May. So talking just a moment about technology comfort levels. So obviously, you know, if somebody were to approach me and with a question about NUA or the new platform or how something works and the code, you know, I would probably be this little emoji on the left-hand side who's really happy and, you know, yeah, that's no problem at all. But, you know, even me, if we step outside a platform or a certain technology or a device that we're used to, that comfort level can change. Um, you know, maybe with uh, a new computer, I might be in the middle or, you know, if something comes up and I, I'm under a deadline, I might go all the way to the right because, you know, it's not new. Maybe it's a new software application or statistics or something. So I just want to say that it's okay to be wherever you're at with, with your technology proficiency um, and comfort. Our goal is to reach you where you are. Um, especially with these new models, with pollen tube growth model, carbohydrate thinning, apple irrigation, whatever you need uh, to kind of be the person who can get an answer for you. So to that end, we've done a lot of things over the past year. Um, I put up this QR code. If you have a phone, you can scan that. Uh, it takes you to the same place uh, that this URL does that I also put in the chat. Um, but as we move forward, I also want to point out that for each of our models, we have uh, specific resources. So in the upper left-hand corner, whether it's pollen tube or anything else, there's always gonna be this watch tutorial link. So you click on that, it's gonna take you to the new help desk, which I'll show you. Again, just multiple ways uh, to increase the chances that you're gonna get the information you quickly need. So if you were to click on that link, uh, on the left-hand side here is what you would find. So I've created a landing page on the NUA knowledge base uh, that lists all of the available supplemental, supplemental resources for Apple uh, management. So uh, this first section I call getting started. And so one of the things you can do in NUA is create a profile account. And I really encourage you to do that, especially with what we're gonna talk about today because there's a lot of custom information that you don't wanna to have to remember every single time. For those of you who use the old website, you'll remember that every single time you had to go uh, to um, uh, a model, you might perhaps have to enter uh, a biofix state or something like that. With NUA 3.0, if you sign up for a profile, uh, those pieces of data or information are gonna be saved to a personal account that's secure. So. Uh, a couple of resources to get started quickly to create a profile. Um, we have one for dashboard navigation, and then just a couple of other supplemental documents and resources there. In particular to today, we have a crop load management section. And so again, we have uh, what I call quick start videos uh, that we, I really tried to uh, limit to uh, five minutes or less. Uh, with the more complex one, you'll see seven and, and six minutes respectively for what we'll talk about today, but it's an opportunity for you on your own time to kind of take a self-guided approach where you know a month or two uh, or, or whenever you are out from now when you maybe don't remember everything we talk about today, you can go back, you can play the video, you can pause it, you can rewind just so that you're comfortable going into the season. Now on the right-hand side, I just have an example page for pollen tube growth model of what you'll find when you click on one of these links. All of our videos are closed captioned. If that's helpful, we try to make these accessible uh, for you all. There's a link to the model page itself. And then again, uh, just linking everything here internally under additional resources uh, are things that might be useful as you continue to use the pollen to growth model. Now, here's the most important part though. So, you know, say you're, you're going through the self-guided resources and you're still not sure, or maybe you think you found a bug on the website. The easiest way to get in touch with the help desk is to send an email uh, to support at nua.zendesk.com. What that does is it creates an electronic work ticket that remains open until we find a resolution for you. Um, either myself or my colleague, Kim Knappenberger, who works out in Western New York State, 
uh, part-time for this, uh, we will get back in touch with you. And at this point, you should um, almost immediately get a confirmation email that says, hey, we got your request, we'll be in touch shortly. But then beyond that, within one or two business days, uh, one of us, you know, a real human being will be in touch to try and follow up on your question or concern uh, and find a resolution for you. Now, there are other ways to get in touch as well. If you are poking around on, on our uh, knowledge base website, you'll see submit a request in the upper right hand corner. You can certainly do that. Uh, you'll just select the submit a help desk form and then go from there. And then it's the same process. Um, and I've already covered a lot of what's on this slide, um, except to provide some context about why uh, we pursued this approach and how it's been successful so far. Um, so questions you can ask, how to onboard a weather station, if you've got bugger error, any sort of information requests. We do very basic uh, weather station troubleshooting at this point, um, but if we have a very low threshold for this, um, and we try to pass you on as quickly as possible to your, your respective vendor if there's something going on. Because our goal is to solve the problem. You know, we're not here um, to solve every technical issue. And sometimes it's just faster uh, to have you work with them. So we'll pass you on in those cases. Uh, we can also put you in touch with your local or regional extension specialist. And then uh, this is really important moving forward. Well, if, if you've got any ideas or suggestions, you know, we're never going to say no. I actually keep a list of uh, grower ideas and things like that. So feel free to reach out. Just to provide uh, quick some quick uh, temporal context is that uh, I did this slide back in the fall. Um, and actually, since then, we're about to break 6,000 work desk tickets. Um, so this system is very efficient. Uh, so despite the volume we get, um, you know, we, we respond pretty quickly to you. Um, I have six day average resolution time because a lot of our questions, you know, can be answered very quickly in one or two uh, sentences. Uh, but every so often, you know, if there is a more technical issue with your weather station, uh, sometimes those will take up to a week or so to fix. Uh, and then again, just the human beings behind this whole operation. So with that, I do want to transition a little bit. We don't have a lot of time, so I apologize for the speed. But um, for the rest of my time, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm just gonna go over the nuts and bolts of the pollen tube growth model. Um, and the next speakers are gonna talk about the why and the how and the, the biological context. Um, again, uh, if you go to this URL that I have up here, um, you'll see the model and you'll see that quick start tutorial link in the upper left. And so that's a good review uh, in the future when you wanna come back and look at this. So I'm gonna walk you right through from the beginning, assuming that you do not uh, have any experience with NUA, that you do not have a user profile account. So uh, when you go to nua.cornell.edu, this is the landing page. And you can kind of think of this more as an advertisement page. So if somebody is not familiar with NUA, it basically showcases some of the features that we have. Um, but to really get the most use out of this platform, you want to create your own account. So in the upper right-hand corner where that first arrow is, um, you'll see a sign-in link. Uh, and when you click on that, you'll get this pop-up. You'll go to sign up. You'll enter an email address and you'll create a password that only you have. And then you click, click agree to new a data use policy. And that's pretty much it. Um, there's some configuration steps after that. Uh, which you can review again through quick start tutorials on the knowledge base, uh, but I won't get into that today. Um, but once you do that, what's going to happen is uh, you'll want to do a little bit of configuration. So uh, when you come in, you're going to be opened to your profile settings. Uh, there's personal info there that you can personalize, uh, but the very first thing you want to do is add at least one favorite station. Now, the advantage to doing that is that uh, if you look at a map of NUA, you'll see that there are over 800 stations. By having a profile, you can select your favorite one or two or even up to 10 or whatever. And those will be the only ones that display across all of your different models, if that makes sense. So here I've selected uh, Shoreham, uh, Vermont, uh, up on the Lake Champlain area, and then the next thing you wanna do is click over to the NUA tools tab, which you'll see I've highlighted with an arrow. 
and then open up the Apple Tools dropdown and select Pollen to Growth Model. This gets you set up uh, to go. So once you click on Dashboard, uh, you simply click back, you'll see that now uh, under Favorite Stations, you've got your selections uh, available. So you'll see Shoreham in the right-hand corner there. If you had more stations selected, those selected stations would show up in that dropdown. The other thing I'll point out though, is we selected pollen tube growth model. And so now that model is available in your personalized dashboard at the bottom. To access the model itself, you click on go to tool. And then on the right-hand side of the screen here, we have what this will look like uh, the first time you use it. You'll see there's not much there. So in the last few slides, I'm just gonna uh, walk us through how you would get this up and going in the next few weeks uh, to use for this growing season. So the first thing you want to do is call what we uh, create what we call a block. So to do that, um, you'll see that create block button. And I didn't put an arrow there. I apologize. But what you would do is you would click that and you get another pop up that says create block. So there's a few different things you want to enter here to get started. You want to enter a block name. This can be anything you want. You can put it in um, a location specific reference or a field number, whatever you want. The next thing you need to do, however, is select your Apple variety. Um, after you select your Apple variety, and the drop down is actually hiding this, you'll enter your pollen tube, or you'll enter your style length, uh, which other speakers will get into. And then you click create. So what happens here on the right-hand side is your preliminary display after you've created a single block. On the left-hand side, you'll see that example one is now listed under blocks. And on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's a summary card or uh, element called example one up at the top where I have an arrow. You'll see that it's got Honeycrisp selected, which is the Apple variety I chose in that pop-up. And then it has an average style length of 13 millimeters, which is the, just an arbitrary number that I had entered to create this. If you ever want to go back uh, to edit this block, uh, you'll click over on the right-hand side of this card where it says edit block, and it'll open up that dialog again. Um, and I'll show you how to enter a second block in another few slides. Um, but what I want to talk about here in the last part of this slide is the fact that um, I'm that we have several different elements available in this model. So right now I have growth graph selected and I have everything else turned off. Um, if you wanna turn more features on, you can turn as many on as you want or hide them. Uh, it's really a personal preference. Uh, so on the right, right hand side, what we have is a visualization of, uh, a, of growth uh, for this block that we've entered. Uh, the starting date that I provided was March 9th. Um, I actually pulled this from a location further south so I could show you what it looks like in real time. But you'll see moving from left to right, uh, you'll see an accumulation value. Now you'll also notice, however, uh, that um, it goes beyond today's date. And that's because we provide forecasted hourly values. I think it goes up to uh, five or six days. Um, I would have to check to be sure. Uh, but it does provide some estimate moving forward for planning purposes. Um, we also have a growth table. And so what you'll see is I've turned off the growth graph on the left-hand side here and turned on growth table. It's simply a tabular representation of what we were just looking at in that growth graph. And then finally, uh, the, the final piece of this model is the hourly temperature graph. Um, and again, this is just a visualization of what those hourly temperature trends are for the period of time that you're looking at. So um, the next thing I'll tell you about is how to add in your sprays. So I have opened the edit block again by clicking that button I mentioned earlier. And now we see uh, this card pop up. To enter your first spray, you simply uh, select a date and actually an hour within that. Uh, click update, and it's going to add your first spray. And you'll see that both in the graph and under the summary card in example one, uh, growth has been reset to zero at whatever date and time you have selected there. So uh, in the graph um, on the 17th, 
at 4 a.m., it resets and then immediately starts accumulating again. So this is one way to help you track through time. And again, we're going above 100% uh, over there on the right because we're looking at predicted forecast values. So uh, in this last slide, I have created a second block and it's exactly the same process. I have these side by side, however, to show you that they track independently. So if you create one block, it's gonna look at uh, weather variables independently of your second block. So you can completely customize these uh, however you like. So again, example one has honey crisp. Example two has golden delicious. Example one has an average style length I entered of 12. Example two has 11 and so on and so forth. Um, but what's really neat is if you look at that summary list over on the left-hand side, you get an at-a-glance view of where your growth is at for each block independently. And with that, I don't know how much time I'm at, um, but I, we could take questions or we could keep going. So Mike, maybe I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Dan. Yep, we are pretty much at time. Um, okay. While you do have that, there was one question that I think would be best to answer now. How do we get into this block area that you were just referencing? Sure. Um, let me pull up my thing again. Um, and let's see here. And let me go back to that slide. Can you all see this still? It's not full screen, but we can see the presentation. All right. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to do that in the interest of time. But let's see here. So uh, let me go down here. I'm going to go back to this slide. So um, to create a block, we have this left panel here. And so um, we have create block. You're going to click that button. And it's going to give you this display on the left hand side. And this is where you can enter your block name. You can select your apple variety. And you can also enter your style link, which um, if I go down here, perhaps I can show you. Yeah, so this is a better example. So again, block name, Apple variety, average style length, and then you enter your start date and any subsequent spray dates. Does that answer the question? Okay. I'll see if he responds back to the chat box. Yep. But I think I think it did a good job of answering it. We do have one more quick question from Randy. Um, if I have a miso net station on my farm, can that data be used for my farm in NUA? So I'm going to answer this in two parts. The short answer is yes, because we do have an agreement with New York State Mazonet, uh, and I'm assuming you're talking about New York State Mazonet, uh, to allow their data to be used in any of our models. Um, the flip side of that is there are still a couple of technical steps we need to do to deploy that statewide, but we do have a formal data use agreement. Um, so I think at this point, it's a matter of being patient. And just as a really quick side note, um, if you ever want uh, straight data from one of those locations, you would have to reach out to them directly. That is not something that will be um, available in NUA. But for the pollen tube growth model, yes, and also for carbohydrate and for irrigation. All right, thank you, Dan. I do see another question in the chat box, but I think we'll probably address that in some of the upcoming presentations. So, yeah. Joanne, I'm going to ask you to hold tight on that one. And in the interest of time, I'm going to invite our next speakers to start sharing their screen. So next, we are going to hear from Dr. Greg Peck and Brent Arnoldson. Dr. Peck is an associate professor in Cornell School of Integrated Plant Science. His research addresses the challenges of sustainably and profitably producing tree fruits in New York. Brent Arnoldson is a postdoc in Dr. Peck's lab, and he is joining us after earning his PhD from Washington State University. So it looks good to me, Greg and Brent, you should be good to go. Great, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Dan, for the um, kind of that opening talk and really talk about how the interface works. Uh, Brent and I are going to talk a little bit about how the model was developed and then also some of our ideas for uh, improvements that we're looking to do in the future. The um, project has really been going on for quite a long time. And I want to give a shout out to my Virginia Tech colleagues, uh, particularly Keith Yoder and Leon Combs, who really did the lion's share of the original work on the model. Uh, both have now retired. 
um, and lots of other people. You can read the, the names there who have been involved in this project. There's others who are also testing and trying to validate this in different parts of the country. We've gotten a lot of funding from Washington State um, for this project, especially in the early years. They do a lot of bloom thinning out there and it was really important to them. And that also um, will inform you about the varieties that we have in the model right now, which were the ones that were important to them at the time. But also funding from the Virginia apple growers, the New York um, apple growers, and a um, fairly new, I guess it's been out now for over a year, so it's not so new, but USDA a Specialty Crop Research Initiative Project that's headed by Terrence uh, called Pac-Man Precision Apple Crop Management. So clever name on that one. Okay, so I, um, my appointment is teaching and research. I know I do a little bit of extension. Um, so as a teacher, I always like to ask pop quiz questions. So I am gonna ask you guys to answer this in the chat while I go through the talk and then we'll revisit this question later. So how many fertilization events are needed to set a full crop in a high density apple orchard? Okay, so you can, you can throw out some guesses or figure out what you what that might be, and then I'll come back to it and give you my um, assumptions on that. So we have a, um, you know, a, uh, uh, not a lot of history with bloom thinning in New York State. It's kind of something that more and more growers are looking to do, but historically has not been a common um, practice for crop load management. But there's a lot of pros, right? You get larger fruit because you're thinning earlier and you have less competition during that cell division phase, right? When, when fruit size, really um, can be increased by having more cells. Um, a lot of our research has shown that you get greater return bloom when you do bloom thinning versus uh, thinning later. And that's again, because we are preventing uh, uh, seeds from forming and those seeds um, produce chemicals that inhibit flower buds. So we can help to uh, break some of the biennial bearing cycle by early thinning. Uh, possible reduction in fungicide applications. We did some work with lime sulfur, lime sulfur and regalia for that. Um, or some of these materials are available for organic growers where the uh, materials available at um, the petal fall 10 millimeter up to 25 millimeter are generally synthetically derived and not available for organic. And now we have this uh, model this is what we call the pollen tube growth model, which allows for more precise applications. In the Eastern US though, I think, you know, some of the reasons why it has not become a, um, a widely used practice is because of frost primarily. And so um, that's been a really big issue for um, a lot of growers and still is. Every year we think about that and how that might affect bloom thinning. Um, we haven't had a lot of experiences with it. And a lot of the timing was fairly subjective based on um, the percent of full bloom open, 20%. And then a second application at 80% was the old rule of thumb with this. It, 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 it uh, worked sometimes, it didn't work other times. And I think it was because it wasn't based necessarily on the biology of the plant. It was based on um, just a visual, how many petals are you seeing in an orchard? And, um, and the materials that we have for bloom thinning tend to be caustic and can cause things like russeting. So just a little reminder on apple flower anatomy. Here's our apple flower here on the far left. Here's kind of a cross section through. So what we're interested in um, for the pollen tube model is the green section here, right? This is the, um, the female part all the way down through the ovule here. And um, you know, this is where our pollen comes from. These are the, the, um, the anthers and the filaments. These, these are uh, the pollen source, that's the male. What we're interested in is when the pollen um, lands on the surface, and we'll look at it on the far right here of the anther, Right, so the pollen is dry, it has to hydrate, there's a lot of protein and some molecular reaction. And then it germinates and you get this pollen tube growing down through the flower. Here's the base of the style. Here's our, um, our, our uh, ovary and our ovules and um, inside the carpal and the pollen tube needs to grow in there. And then um, there's a double fertilization practice is, is or um, event that happens. And um, then you have fertilization. Okay, so the pollen tube growth model is measuring the time it takes from pollen to start growing on the top of the anther all the way down to the, um, I'm sorry, the top of the stigma all the way down to, um, to fertilization. 
Okay, and we, we figured this out through a lot of empirical work. We had these dwarf apple trees, kind of bonsai apple trees. We, they were in the field like this over here on the top right. And um, we can pull them out of the ground because they're in root bags and then force them in a greenhouse to flower, uh, emasculate them, do controlled pollination, stick them into a growth chamber that we're seeing here on the bottom left picture at a set temperature. And then after a certain amount of time, pull them out, um, harvest the flowers, and then we can visualize the flowers using um, uh, fluorescent microscopy. So this is, um, again, some of the pictures on top. This is you know, very similar to what a breeder would do, right? They're taking pollen, and they're just putting it right on top of the uh, stigma. And then this is some of the visualization here. So these are the pollen tubes on the top here. You can see them uh, fluoresced in blue. And then this is just pubescence down here. And then these darker blue lines are measuring. This one is um, 8.3 millimeters. Okay, so by doing these at different temperatures in the growth chamber, um, we can measure the growth rate, right? If you know the length by the time, length by time, we can figure out rate. And, and then we do some various temperatures. And so then we can generate these, uh, these curves here. And then if you then take this out into, how does this apply to what you're doing out in the field? We have all these weather stations with NUA now. So they're recording hourly temperatures. So the data gets sent to NUA into their servers. They use the equations that we built through this model, and then they um, can generate the amount of growth of the pollen tube each hour, and then add them up so you get this cumulative growth curve over time, okay? Up to 100%, which is the style length. Okay, so the style length is something that you have to measure in the field. And so we're measuring from the top of the, of the stigma to kind of, through the middle of the carpal there, um, almost down to the um, to the calyxes here. So not just the styles themselves, but um, down to the bottom there. And we figure that fertilization is probably happening somewhere in there where my pointer is. So we are measuring the starting point to the finish line and how, how long does that take to, um, to happen? And that's the pollen tube growth model, okay? And so this is just an example here of measuring. It can be measured with calipers. Um, it can be measured with a little ruler. We generally go out and harvest a whole bunch of flowers, like 50, and measure them and then input an average of 50 styles. Now, the other big um, thing is to know when to start the clock. And so that's when the, um, the last flower that you want to be your crop for that year has opened, last king flower, king bloom flower, right? The last one that is open. So that can be based on a number of metrics. Now growers and growers are getting more used to counting these things through um, uh, branch cross-sectional area like you do for fruit counting. Um, and so if you knew that you had, you wanted six apples per, um, uh, per trunk cross-sectional area, then that could be your target. You have six flowers per trunk or branch cross-sectional open. Based on experience, a lot of growers are now kind of eyeballing it. Um, I think we need to get to better systems for that and we're, we have some work along those lines. And then the first thinning spray happens when the pollen tubes have been modeled to grow beyond the longest style or the average style is what you input. Okay, in other words, the flower at that point has been fertilized. And then additional thinning sprays are used to prevent fertilization. Okay, so that's the key. So the they have two different functions of those um, of measuring the pollen tube growth. The first is to allow a certain percentage of the flowers to get fertilized. And then the additional ones are to prevent any more fertilization to have happen. So this is just kind of an example. Dan showed you one, I think Michael probably showed you some. Um, so this is cumulative growth rate of the pollen tubes up to 111% of the style length. And then we put on a caustic material and then we started the clock again. And then at 70%, we put a second spray on and that would have prevented any more pollen tubes from reaching the base of the style and fertilizing the eggs. So we have um, models now for seven cultivars. Uh, we're looking to add more. Uh, here's our list here. And you can see these are really Washington State. We know we have a, uh, a uh, important for Washington State. We know we have a lot more diversity here in the East. So we're, we're working on that. And that's some of the work that Brent is working on. But we have been using the model for years now in Washington, Virginia, 
uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and of course, New York. It's an example of Washington's there. You know, there are some, there are some model limitations. Um, it assumes that we have optimal B activity. It's on the other slide as well, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit for good B activity for the European honeybee. Um, we don't have these models for all the different uh, cultivars that we grow, or varieties that we grow in the Eastern US. Um, we're still figuring out what chemistries to use. And I think that's a, a, you know, a big open question. Um, I think Mike's gonna show some work on, on some trials that he did in the Champlain Valley. Um, and then uh, we've done some work looking at the paternal effects of, of, um, of pollen sources. So the different, uh, uh, the model was using snowdrift, which is a common pollinizer in Washington state. We have a lot more diversity of pollen sources here in the east. And there's some questions around that. There's actually some cool research showing that when you have more than one genotype on um, that land on the, um, on the stigmatic surface here, that they actually grow faster. They start competing with each other than if you just had one genotype. So there's some factors that we just haven't really figured out how to model yet. Okay, oops. So let's go back to the question here. And uh, uh, I only see a few responses in the chat of how many fertilizations we can have. I don't know, Mike, are there any there that I'm missing? Nope, I see just those couple there, so. Okay. Uh, if well, you want to get your guess in, now's the time. This is not a very interactive group. Um, you guys are not gonna get a high score in your quiz, but here's my math on it. Um, and I just kind of scratched this out. I don't know if this is exact, but just kind of a fun thing to do. I assume that there were a thousand trees per acre in a spindle type planting. You need about a hundred apples per tree to get your thousand bushels per acre, you know, of, you know you go into all the different sizes, but that's a good round number to use. We figure there's five seeds per apple. There can be up to 10, right? So, and then we have the double fertilization event for, um, for angiosperms, okay? So if we do the first three bullets here, we get to a half a million um, pollen tubes, and then you have two fertilization events for angiosperm. So then we get up to a million, right? That's just to um, get to the desired crop load, not including all the extra fruit that got um, fertilized. And then that's fertilization, not pollination. I don't know how many um, pollen grains would land on a stigmatic surface in an apple orchard. Um, might be 10, might be 100 times more. But I think the, the point is um, when we're talking about modeling, um, you know, we're trying to model what's happening uh, a million, several million times in an orchard and trying to come up with a model that works for that. So, um, you know, some of the difficulties and challenges and, and the fun part of it. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Brent now. And Brent, you'll just have to um, tell me to advance when you're ready. Yes, sounds good. All right, so I just wanted to uh, uh, jump in here and kind of talk about the work that I'm doing as part of my postdoc project, which sort of builds off of uh, the limitations of the current model that Greg mentioned in his talk. So this work is part of a national uh, SCRI project uh, that Greg mentioned on precision crop load management in apples. And sort of the goal of what I'm working on is how can we use the most recent techniques and modeling, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to have a more powerful pollen tube growth model. And, and by that, I mean, how can we have a, a more accuracy, more adaptability to the model, a model that is e easily expanded, but most importantly, we're looking for so something that's quote unquote universal. Um, so I could go to the next slide, maybe Greg. So initially, um, what I'm doing right now is uh, taking the original data that uh, Greg mentioned that's been collected from essentially 2005 to about uh, 2017 and using some different, uh, different techniques uh, to do some different things with the models. So the first thing I'm looking at is different model techniques. So um, the, uh, things like making a thermal time model, which is like a growing degree hours model, which assumes that pollen tube growth uh, can't happen below a certain temperature. And also looking at um, something called the percent style or penetration. So this is instead of looking at uh, how, uh, what the growth rate would be at given temperatures, it's basically how much the stigma, or the stigma is being penetrated by uh, the pollen tubes. Next, I'm looking at some classification models. So these are models that separate or rank different factors. And this is 
allowing us to find which factors are going to be most important on growth rates. Is it temperature? Is it uh, paternal uh, or is it uh, paternal cultivar? Is it um, uh, location? These types of things. And it could also allow us to group different cultivars into ranges like slow, mid, and fast. And this might make it easier for us to add new cultivars in the model. So if we have a cultivar that we can classify as a slow, we can use the slow uh, models uh, as sort of a proxy. And then lastly, we're looking at uh, forecasting uh, machine learning models. So these are models that look at many different factors to predict a Y value. And so this would be um, a model that we're currently trying to develop using many different data sources um, to sort of train the model, so to speak. All right, next slide, Greg. So here's a, a look at a couple, uh, a comparison of sort of the, the uh, current model versus some of the models that I'm working on. And so on the left is essentially what we have that we're working with in NUA. So um, on the y-axis, you have the pollen growth rates. And then on the x-axis, you have the, the temperatures. However, then on the right, what we're looking at is um, a model that is um, set at a growing degree hours with base temperature of 4.5 Celsius. And on the y-axis, uh, we're looking at the percent styler penetration. Um, so this is just a little bit more of a, a transferable way for us to look at the data. Uh, so we can take data from many different experiments um, and create a model that has many different data points to look at many different factors and have a, a ostensibly a more accurate model. All right, next slide, Greg. And so just a little overview of what we're doing now um, with the field trials to expand and validate the model. Currently, we're developing a sampling protocol that we can use in regional testing that's gonna be done this spring in New York, Virginia, um, North Carolina, and Washington. And then we're gonna do some field trials that are gonna be uh, conducted regionally to validate the model um, as the old models and the new model. And then we're gonna take all that data, uh, feed it into the model to expand the model, to look at different, um, uh, different factors uh, and add more data points to make the model more accurate. So then one more quick, Greg. And so hopefully we're gonna have a beta testing of the new model. Uh, tentatively sometime in uh, maybe spring of 2024. Great. I think we are um, at the end of our slide deck, Brent, uh, Mike. All right. Thanks so much, Greg and Brent. And I see we are getting a little bit behind time. So if it's all right with you two, I'm just going to ask that we hold questions till, till the Q&A session. But uh, feel free to type them into the chat box too, and you both could certainly address them there as well. So thank you both. Thank you. So just bear with me, folks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the next speaker here. So I just need to swap some windows around on my screen. All right. So hopefully you should all be seeing my presentation now. Uh, would someone be able to confirm that with me? Looks good, Mike. All right, thank you, Andy. Uh, so for my presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about the applied research I've been doing here in, in the Champlain Valley over the past two years using the pollen tube growth model. So just a, a quick background on, on crop load management here in northern New York. Generally during the our typical petal fall and 12 millimeter thinning season, we, we do tend to have fairly cool sunny weather. So it can make it difficult in some years for our PGRs to really give us the amount of thinning that we might be looking for. In addition to that, in 2019 and 2021, we've had some issues with return bloom on our Honeycrisp block. So uh, we're very interested in, in using different materials that we can use earlier at bloom to start that thinning process to hopefully get better return bloom. And we're also interested in just having more materials available that can complement those PGR materials that we are traditionally using at petal fall and 12 millimeter. So there has been a lot of interest in trying out some of these different materials at bloom. And to that extent, a few growers have been using ammonium thiosulfate, which is one of those caustic materials that Greg was talking about. 
at bloom time and have been using it on and off for a couple of years with varied success. So uh, there was a lot of interest in, in using this material. So, you know, it was really well timed that these models were becoming available to us. And again, I'll just briefly discuss the pollen tube growth model with you. Uh, just to show this is from a previous example where we had gone out and, and measured those those style links as, as Greg mentioned, popped those into the model, and then counted the number of blooms that were opening up on the trees, to which point the number of flowers matched our target crop load per tree. We entered that into the model, and in this case we got an application on at 70% of the pollen tube growth and a follow-up one at 80%. So that's, again, how you read that model. And then on top of that, there's also another model that Terrence will talk about later called the fruit growth rate model that we've also been, been using. And with this model, essentially, you go out and you, you again, count the number of, of fruit buds that are on those trees. And then we tag off 15 clusters and measure the fruitlets after our different thinner applications. And we can actually predict how many fruit are remaining as we go through those sequential thinning applications. So for this project, what we really wanted to do was combine those two models and answer the question of, of how ammonium thiol sulfate and lime sulfur time with the pollen to growth model compare with our more traditional bloom thinning programs. And we wanted to see its effect on crop value in that year, and then also how well it promoted return bloom in the following season. So I'll show you our, our trial setups. And there's a lot here, but the basics I wanna show you is that in our 2020 gala trials, we had two rows of gala on M9. These were planted back in 2012 and they were trained to a tall spindle at four by 12 foot spacing. And as far as the actual treatments, you'll see treatment one was a fairly traditional NAA at 10 parts at full bloom. And then we follow that up with a fairly traditional petal fall, 12 millimeter and 18 millimeter program based on the fruit growth rate model outputs. In contrast with that, we had our experimental treatment. This was that ammonium thiol sulfate, and we applied that at 60% pollen tube growth model growth. And that went on twice. So that first time at 60% and then a follow up application when it hit 60% again. And then those trees were followed with that same follow-up applications at petal fall 12 millimeter and 18 millimeter. This is our 2021 gala trial and very similar, same block as 2020 and very similar setup as far as our treatments. Again, that NAA at full bloom and our treatment two was again, ATS at 60%. The only difference in this case was that we actually did three applications of the ATS. And the reasoning for that was we had a lot of lateral uh, blooms that were opening up on one-year-old axillary buds. So we wanted to make sure we were hitting those. And then we had a, a couple of small changes to our follow-up applications. Now I'll switch over to our, our Honeycrisp trials. Looking at 2020, we had two rows of Honeycrisp on M9. This was a younger block. It was planted in 2015 and was trained to a vertical ax at a six by 14 foot spacing. And again, you can see our first treatment was a traditional NAA at full bloom. And our other treatment was ATS. And this one actually went on a bit earlier at 20% pollen tube growth model development. So for this trial, we only did one application. And then these were both followed up with a petal fall treatment. And then finally, our final setup was our 2021 Honeycrisp trial. These were two rows of Honeycrisp again on M9. This was trained to tall spindle, three by 14 foot spacing, planted in 2012. And now we had that NAA treatment. We had a ATS treatment, two applications at 60%. And then we had a third treatment this year and this was lime sulfur and oil. And this went on at 100% pollen tube growth for that first application. And then for the follow-up application, we put it on at 60% pollen tube growth. And then again, we had follow-up applications based on the fruit growth rate model at petal fall, 12 millimeter and 18 millimeter. 
So we did use the fruit growth rate model as well as the pollen tube growth model. And again, for this model, we tagged 15 clusters on five of the ATS treated trees at pink. And then we counted the number of fruit clusters per tree to tell us what our starting bud count was. And again, we were excluding one-year-old axillary buds when we were counting those clusters. And then following our petal fall application and each subsequent application, we went out and measured the fruitlets of those tied clusters. And we did that at 50 and 120 degree days base four following those applications. Now I do wanna quickly tell you about our, the harvest evaluations that we did. So at harvest, we went out and recorded the number of fruit per tree and the weight of the fruit coming off of each tree. We also calculated fruit size and we also have data on fruit quality, including size and color. And in 2021, we also evaluated fruit russeting in our honey crisp and gala trials. And then we also did return bloom measurements the following spring. Of course, we don't have the 2021 return bloom yet. We'll be getting that in a few weeks. So looking at some of our results, I did want to briefly touch on the fruit growth rate model. You can see this from three of our sites. Starting with the 2021 gala model, our target crop load per tree was 100 in fruit. And we actually calculated that our initial fruit on the tree was about 1,225. So uh, certainly a lot of thinning to be done. Following that post petal fall application, the model was predicting that we had 723 left. So that tells us that thinning with ATS alone was not doing the full thinning job that we needed. So we put on those additional applications. And by the end of thinning, the model was predicting that we had about 74 fruit per tree. And at harvest, we actually had about 167 fruit per tree. We saw fairly similar in 2021 on Gala. Our target again was 100. We started around 1200. Uh, post petal fall, we were down to 527. And then it was predicting 94 at the end of our thinning. And we actually had 168 fruit per tree. And then looking at our 2021 Honeycrisp, we were targeting 85. Our initial fruit was at 1817. Following our bloom thinners, we were at about 1000. And then finally, following all of our thinner applications, it was predicting we were at 91. And we actually picked about 108 off of each tree. So we were fairly close on that one. But Terrence will talk more about the fruit growth rate model shortly. So now I want to show you our harvest results for our, our gala trials. So when we look at our 2020 results, again, just pointing out that our target crop load per tree was 100 fruit. And you can see the number of fruit from both of those different bloom treatments. Uh, generally, we, we did not quite reach our target. And in fact, we saw very few differences in terms of the number of fruit per tree. Uh, we also did not see differences in terms of the yield per tree or the fruit size or the fruit color. And we also did not see a, a noticeable difference in crop value nor return bloom. So overall, we had very similar results between both of those bloom thinning treatments between that traditional NAA and the ATS with the pollen to growth model. So we we're getting similar results out of it. And we saw very similar results this past year in 2021. So again, targeting 100 fruit per tree. Again, fairly similar numbers, 168 versus 183. And again, uh, no significant differences in terms of yield, fruit size, fruit color, or crop value per acre between those two bloom treatments. So now we'll take a look at our Honeycrisp harvest results. So in 2020, our target crop load for those trees because they were younger was only 45. And we were very close to our target in both the ATS and the NAA at bloom treatments. Uh, and they did not differ statistically between those two. Nor did we see any statistical differences in terms of the yield per tree, the fruit size, fruit color, or crop value between those two. And we also did not see any differences in return bloom and we were really disappointed. Uh, the return bloom in, in this block was just very, very poor this year, five and, and 2%, so very low. Uh, we do know that 2020 was a very stressful year, so we, we think that paired with it being a, a young block on a sandy soil are likely at play here. Looking at our 2021 harvest results, 
Again, we have ATS, lime sulfur, and NAA now. Again, we did not see any statistical difference in our number of fruit per tree. And again, I'll mention our target was 85. So the lime sulfur treatment got closest at 87, followed by the NAA at 105, and then the ATS at 108. But again, statistically, there, there was no difference here. Nor was there any difference in terms of yield per tree or fruit size. Interestingly, we did see an increase in fruit color in both the ATS and the lime sulfur at bloom treatments. And I also want to point out, as Greg mentioned earlier, that we could have some, some negative impacts from, from using these caustic materials, and one of those being russeting of the fruit. So when we looked at our percent of russet free fruit, the NAA treated trees nearly free of russeting. The ATS treated trees did have some russeting, about 9%. And then we actually had about 17% russeting on our lime sulfur treated fruit. And so when we look at sort of the fruit quality of fruit size and fruit color and pair that with the amount of russet free fruit, we were able to develop a, a relative crop value per acre. And uh, we, we found no statistical difference, but I think it is interesting to point out that our estimated crop value per acre for the ATS treated fruit came out to about 28,800, while the lime sulfur and the NAA at bloom came out to about 23, 24,000. So not statistically different, but still in my mind, a noticeable difference when we look at the, the numbers. So I do also just wanna briefly show those same economics, this time added in with the, the cost for those materials. Um, so this just shows the cost of the materials for all the applications along with a, a rough labor rate associated with them. And when we look at the crop value and the cost differences, you can see for our gala trials, uh, they came out to, or in 2020, excuse me, ATS in, in 2020 gave us better returns in our gala and in our Honeycrisp trial. And when we look at 2021, we had a higher value from NAA in our GALA trial. But again, in our, our 2021 Honeycrisp trial, we did see quite a bit of a jump with the ATS treatment. So the takeaways from the past two years, generally I would say bloom thinning at a 2.5% concentration timed at 60% pollen two growth model looks to be as effective as NAA at bloom when we combine them with additional thinners later in a in a uh, combined thinning program. But I do want to just point out, you know, think about if it's worth the extra time commitment. Um, and it, it certainly may be if you are able to get better return bloom. Uh, we didn't see it in our, our first year, but we are hoping to see some differences there. But it certainly does take a bit more time investment to go out, measure the styles, count the blooms opening on your tree. So something to, to keep in mind if you're going to be doing this. Again, while not statistically significant, the Honeycrisp crop value does appear to increase with the ATS at bloom. We wanna repeat this again and, and see if that trend continues. And again, we saw that from the increase in fruit size and color. The lime sulfur at the 100% pollen two growth did give comparable levels of thinning in Honeycrisp in 2021. But again, we did note that there was some rustling from the ATS and even more rustling from that lime sulfur treatment. So the crop value was improved in the lime sulfur in terms of the size and color, but that was negated by the russeting. Um, and lime sulfur is not labeled in New York and certainly partially for that reason. So return bloom was not improved by ATS in 2020 in either our Honeycrisp or our Gala trial. Again, we know that was a very stressful year. So I'm curious to see what we find out in the next few weeks. As far as the fruit growth rate model, it did over predict the amount that it took off on our, our GALA trial, but I do think that part of that was from my own user error. Uh, so we're, we're gonna be adjusting that a bit this year. And again, there is a bit of a, a time commitment for doing that, but I do find it very valuable. If you do have the time, it is a really nice way to have a sense of how much thinning you've done with your previous application. So if you have that time, I do recommend using it. And Terrence will talk more about that shortly. 
And then when it comes to taking the pollen to growth model and really scaling it up for commercial use here in, in the Champlain Valley, uh, we did find that there are just logistical challenges. In a year where you have a prolonged bloom like we did in 2021, uh, trees were opening up very slowly. So when exactly do you start the model was, was a difficult question for us. In addition, one of the blocks we were working was very close to the lake. So trees that were closer to the lake, getting that cooler air were opening up much more slowly than trees just a few hundred feet away. So being able to account for that is a, a, a big management question that we wanna keep working with to, to address. And then certainly on farms with multiple blocks of different varieties and rootstocks and different ages, uh, again, those flowers are opening up at different times. So uh, certainly more work to be done to figure out how to best scale this up to a commercial operation. So moving forward, we are planning to repeat this study for a final year, and we're going to include lime sulfur in our GALA trial next year. And we're also planning to add a, a three and a half percent ammonium thiosulfate treatment to see if we can reduce the amount of follow-up PGR applications that we need to make. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk. I'd like to thank the Northern New York Agricultural Development Program for funding this project. And I'd like to thank Dr. Robinson and Peck, my technician, Andy Gallenberti, and Northern and Florence Orchards for helping out with this project. So thank you. So just give me a second, folks. I'm gonna put my moderator hat back on now. Mike, uh, while you're getting yourself sorted out there on your computer, uh, there is a question here from John Klein. Um, Given that you didn't have an untreated control or hand thin control in your blossom experiment, how do you know ATS and lime sulfur actually worked? Right, that's a that's a great question, John. Uh, certainly, working with commercial blocks, I I struggle to ask them to leave a, a portion of their their trees un unsprayed. Uh, so we were really using the NAA at bloom treatment as sort of our our control. Uh, certainly. You know, there's there's going to be the question of, you know, was it, you know, did did the trees just naturally thin themselves? Uh, so we thought we'd at least have that NAA at bloom treatment to kind of serve as as a check against the experimental treatment. But I I do understand that that is a um, issue with the the setup of the trial. All right, so with that, I do see we are getting a little bit behind time here. So I'm gonna hold any other questions and I'm going to invite Dr. Robinson to share his screen and get into the next talk. So Dr. Robinson is an applied fruit crop physiologist at Cornell. His main areas of interest include orchard systems, fruit stocks, crop load management, and precision orchard management. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna give a sort of a primer course on how to use these two models that um, we think are very valuable in trying to manage crop load. I really wanna also congratulate Greg Peck for bringing the pollen tube growth model to New York. I think it's a tremendous addition. I'll make just a couple of comments about how bloom thinning fits for us. But my main focus is gonna be on <clears throat> these two post bloom thinning models. I start with just a review of this precision chemical thinning process that we've been promoting now for about 10 years now. <clears throat> it starts with, it's a, <clears throat> it's a protocol to use sequential thinning sprays, and try to sequentially reduce the crop load down to some target number. We begin with the blossom thinning sprays using the pollen tube growth model as has been described earlier. But starting with the petal fall spray and the succeeding sprays after petal fall, the carbon balance model becomes an important tool in deciding both when to spray and at what dose to spray. So for each one of those succeeding sprays, <clears throat> we use the carbohydrate model to try to guide us in both those two decisions. But after each spray, we use the fruit growth rate model to try to determine what happened with each of those sprays to guide whether or not we spray again. So it's possible in some years, you might get all your thinning done with the blossom spray and the petal fall spray and stop. And the way that you judge that is through the use of the fruit growth rate model. 
in many other years, you have to spray again at 10 to 13 millimeters. And then in many years, that's enough. <clears throat> but in odd years, when thinners don't work so well, we have to come back in with a last spray at the 16 to 20 millimeter stage. <clears throat> I want to first start with just a review of the carbon balance model. This model was developed um, in the mathematical sense, primarily by Alan Laxo, but then he and I together put this together to help with thinning. It's based on two simple parts of the tree physiology. First is what is the photosynthesis process, which produces the carbon to support all the action of growth functions of the tree. And that's primarily defined by temperature and sunlight. So when we think about the impacts of um, sunlight and temperature on what's going to happen with thinning, we're primarily thinking about how much carbon is going to be available to support fruit growth. The other side of the equation is really the uses of that carbohydrate, <clears throat> and that's dependent mostly on temperature. And so we have algorithms in this model that then distribute the carbon that's produced to the places that need the carbon, uh, fruits, shoots, roots, trunk, <clears throat> And then we come up with a carbon balance, whether there's enough carbohydrate to support all the functions that the tree is doing, or there is a deficit. And we do this by day. <clears throat> now, starting, I don't remember when. Well, I do remember that in the 2000s, I was running this model by myself, by hand. It was very time consuming. <clears throat> and so I really had the dream of putting this up for growers to use themselves and somewhere in around 2010 or so, we got this up on the NUA website. And I want to uh, go through some of the particulars and some of the information that's contained in the carbohydrate model as you see it on NUA. <clears throat> I also want to mention that uh, while I was gone on leave, Pollyanna <clears throat> was able to produce a phone app where the same information from NUA can be seen in a phone app called MalUSIM. It has a slightly different um, look to it, but the information on the phone app MalUSIM essentially comes from the NUA website. So the first thing that's important when you go to the NUA website is to pick the station, weather station. And uh, Dan already covered some of this, but I would like to highlight <clears throat> that when you click on the uh, carbohydrate model, this is the landing page that you see. And you see here the station, I've selected Geneva, New York. You see the calendar where you can pick the date you wanna look at. But also down here is this small toggle switch to select a different station. And so when you click on that button, you come comes up with a map. And in this case, I picked the Geneva station so that when I run the model, it will use the weather data from the Geneva station. <clears throat> the second thing you need to do is to pick a date. I happen to pick June 10th from last year of 2021. That was near the end of the thinning window, just to show you what it looked like through the entire thinning period. And if you're running this in real time, that would be today's date. So if you're looking at putting on a petal fall spray, it would be the date of petal fall. The second thing you have to choose or enter are two dates, the date of green tip and the date of full bloom. Now we hope that every grower will write these dates down for their orchard so that a few weeks later, when you need to run the carbohydrate balance, you can have those dates. If you didn't write them down, we can generally provide a reasonable estimate because we keep track of it by region in the state. <clears throat> the last thing that we incorporated into the model about three years ago was this uh, last thing you must choose, and that is how strong or how intense is the flowering. And we've just divided it down into four categories. You know, 75 to 100 percent of the spurs are flowering that's intense flowering if 50 to 75 are flowering then that's more moderate flowering if only 25 to 50 percent of the spurs are flowering that's light flowering 
and certainly below 25% of the spurs flowering. It's extremely light and would not warrant thinning. <clears throat> Once you enter that, the model will automatically calculate for you and will show you this um, page with a tabular form of the data and then a graphical rep representation of the last column of the data, which is the carbohydrate balance average. Now I point out with the arrows, the important things that I think you should pay attention to when you use the model. And Right here, I have this starting at green tip on in 2021, which for Geneva was March 26. I don't think that this year in 2022, we're gonna have such an early green tip. I am predicting it more towards April 15th, but the model will start based upon the green tip date that you put in as you started the model. And so this table, you could scroll through from green tip all the way down to today's date. <clears throat> It has the first two columns are maximum and minimum temperature. I've kept these columns in there for two reasons. First is there's long standing pomology, pomological wisdom saying the temperatures above 80 degrees give much greater thinning. And so I want growers to pay attention when temperatures are high. The second pomological wisdom is that when nighttime temperatures are above 60 degrees at night, you get a lot more thinning. And so by looking at those temperatures, you can kind of get a sense of what's going to happen. But what's not built into pomological knowledge is the third column, which is solar radiation. Generally, this is a number that people don't pay attention to or know about, but it's in a scale called megajoules per square meter. And that scale goes basically from a very low two to three to four number up to about 30. So intense sunlight in New York is about 30 megajoules per square meter. And you can see just in these numbers that on March the 30th, it was a sunny day. We had more than 20 megajoules. And then um, two days before that was very cloudy on March 28th, we only had four megajoules in the entire day. The next two columns are really the results of the model. And they're the carbohydrate balance for that day. And generally it's a negative balance if there is a deficit. <clears throat> and then the next column is what we call the seven day weighted average or thinning index. And this uh, considers the daily carbohydrate balance for two days before a spray or and the day of spray plus four days after the spray. So once a chemical is applied, the hormone type chemicals, NAA, Maxell, those things, they're absorbed by the plant and they continue to act metabolically within the plant for three or four days after application. Therefore, the temperatures and sunlight for three to four days after application have an impact on thinning. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to scroll way down on that table down into the thinning period. It starts on March 28th in that year, but now I'm down into May of 2021. Now, I said full bloom was on May 2nd. So once we get into bloom, then the model will start coloring the cells of both the carbohydrate columns into one of four colors. And they're listed here across the top. If you sprayed on that day, March 2nd, full bloom, and with these conditions before and after the spray, we would expect mild thinning. And hence, they're all colored blue. And for this whole period, you see there all the cells are colored blue. If they're colored green, we would expect good thinning. If they're colored pink we'd ex or a light orange, they'd be very, very good. But if they're colored red or pink, then you would have excessive thinning. And one of the most important things about this model is to avoid over thinning events when thinning is gonna be ex excessive and people don't realize it and they spray anyway. The last column is this daily recommendation. If you happen to thin on that day, what Terrence Robinson would suggest you do as far as rate. I wanna explain this just a little bit. We publish each year in what's called the Cornell Recommends for New York State, a standard thinning rate for each variety. And so there's a different standard thinning rate for Macintosh than for Gala. What we're saying here in the model is that taking that standard rate, 
on this particular day, if you thin on May 2nd, you should increase the rate of chemical that you're applying because it's going to be very mild thinning and you won't get much out of just a standard rate. And we tell you to either increase a small amount or a large amount. The most we ever tell you to increase is about 30%. Also, we have these little circles with a color in them. And these are whether there's low risk of over thinning or some caution, or there's a high risk of over thinning. And so you see during these days, right after bloom, there was always a low risk of, over, of thinning. So in summary, what the model has are these important data points to help you understand what's gonna happen when you spray. I should mention again that there's both the web-based version on NUA and there's the mobile phone version at malusim.com. If you go to malusim.com, you can download an app for free and there will be a new updated version for 2022. So you should probably all re-download the app after uh, April 15th. The second thing that we've added in recent years is this use of relative bloom density to predict thinning response. If you have a moderate to light bloom, often thinning response is much lighter. If you have an extremely heavy bloom, you get a greater thinning response. And that's built in to the behind the scenes table that helps give the recommendation in the last column of the table. Now, I didn't mention but I do want to mention right now that there's a column before this thinning recommendation, which is a degree day column that we added a couple of years ago for two reasons. This is a degree day accumulation since bloom because of the long-term study we did of 17 years of applying the same treatments at Geneva. We found that the best thinning was always when degree days were between 200 and 250. And so we've now come up with some additional uh, recommendations based on that degree day uh, number. We suggest that a petal fall spray should go on somewhere between 110 degree days and 130 degree days after full bloom. If you apply the petal fall spray sooner than that, it almost is ineffective. But by waiting until that moment, then you get the best effect from a petal fall spray. As I just said, the best timing for the 12 millimeter spray is between 200 and 250 degree days. And then there's also a window about 100 degree days later between 300 and 350 when you can apply when fruits are big and still get some thinning. Now the model also predicts thinning efficacy based upon the seven days, two days previous to the spraying and four days after the spraying plus the day you spray. It's a complex formula weighting the day you spray and the next two days after you spray higher than the two days before spraying or the last two days in this formula. <clears throat> so that's the basics of how the carbohydrate model works. Now, how do we use it? We try to time each one of the three post-bloom sprays based upon temperature degree days after bloom. So in recent years, we've been telling people, watch the, the carbon balance model, run it every day. And then when you get close to the 110 degree days after bloom, try to find a day to apply your petal fall spray. About a week later, it turns out, we generally get into the 200 to 250 degree days, and that's when we would try to find the best day in which to apply the 10 millimeter, 13 millimeter spray. And then if we need thinning, more thinning, we would put on the last spray between 300 and 350 degree days after bloom. Now, let me show you how this worked in practice. These are three locations in New York. Hudson Valley was where Milton is. Williamson is in Western New York. And then Peru is in the Champlain Valley where Mike Basedow is located. And I put down graphs from the carbohydrate model along with blue boxes showing the three different post-bloom thinning windows. 
The vertical line here at the beginning shows when full bloom was, and I'm sure you can't read the dates, but you can tell that the time from full bloom to when the petal fall window opened, 110 to 130 degrees, degree days in the, in the Hudson Valley was relatively short. Uh, in Western New York, it was even shorter. And in the Champlain Valley, it was just about the same as in the Hudson Valley. The main point I want to emphasize is the number of days in each window varies with how cold or warm it is. In the Hudson Valley, the petal fall window was quite long, about five days long, because it was cool. But when we, and you can tell the carbon balance was positive, that's what happens under cool weather. But you can tell when they got to the normal thinning spray of 10 to 13 millimeters, the window was very short. It was only three days long. And you had to pick a day in those three days to spray. Whereas 18 millimeters, it was a little bit longer. The exact opposite happened in Western New York. When they got to petal fall in Western New York last year, it was hot. And so the petal fall window was only three days long. But then by the time we got to 10 millimeters, it was cooler. And so we had about a six day window on which to choose the best day to apply our 10 millimeter spray. But when we got to the 18 millimeters, it was warm again and much shorter. And you can see that each one of the three regions had a different number of days in each window because we're working off of degree days. Now the carbohydrate model will help you understand that by this column of accumulated degree days. We put into the model this black box that surrounds the, temp the degree days when we're in the prime window between 200 and 250. So this was for, um, I can't remember exactly where this is, but on May the 26th, the accumulated 200 degree days since bloom. And we would have said, that's the first day you should put on or could put on your 10 millimeter to 12 millimeter spray. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six days before the degree days accumulate past 250 in which to apply your spray. So within those six days, you would tend to look at days without rain, days without temperatures in the 90s. And so you'd come over here and you'd look, well, on May 26th, they had a 90 degree temperature. I probably would avoid that day. But then I've got relatively cool temperatures and the last day is a 75. So probably pick one of these days, either the last two, May 30th or May 31st to put on that 10 millimeter spray, assuming it wasn't too windy. So you have to battle all of those factors watching temperatures, watching rainfall, watching wind speed, but you hopefully you can find one of those six days on which to apply your thinning spray. And this is the way we used the data last year in some of our thinning meetings. This is a slide that I pulled from a presentation I gave um, for a 10 millimeter type spray. And I looked at that chart on the previous slide and I told people, you have basically between May 26th and May 31st to apply your 10 to 13 millimeter spray. I suggested that any one of those six days would give relatively mild thinning. Now, how did we know that? Well, we get that over here from the color of the boxes. Now, you can tell that it's mild thinning from the blue color of the box. A little previous to that, it was green, but during the period of time that we're going to be suggesting they thin, it was all relatively mild thinning. The temperatures were only going to rise up into the 60s and mid 70s by the end of that six day window. But the big problem was that the carbohydrate balance is generally positive. And that's where we see this upper thing up here. Through this whole window of the optimum thinning period, the carbohydrate balance was positive indicating we wouldn't get very aggressive thinning. So I said the carbohydrate surplus and cool temperatures will give mild thinning, therefore use full rates. What did the model suggest? It said the increase rates by 30% for every one of those days if you were gonna thin then. But I also indicated that because of the cool temperatures, even with increased rates, it was unlikely that that particular spray would give enough thinning so we would probably be forced to come back with a rescue spray at 18 millimeters. 
All of this depends on the temperatures and the sunlight that you happen to get when you enter these various thinning windows. So we know, or we can predict at least somewhat what we think is going to happen when we spray at either petal fall or we spray at 10 millimeters or at 18 millimeters. But not knowing exactly what happened leads us often to feel like we're on pins and needles because we have to decide if we're going to spray again before we really can see how many apples have dropped off. If you wait to look at that visually, it takes about two weeks from any spray to really see how many apples have fallen or will fall. You wait for their stems to yellow up and then you look at how many are falling. But often we need to make a decision on whether to respray in only one week's time. Therefore, the development of this fruit growth rate model that Duane Green developed in, in one of the years he was on sabbatic here in Geneva, with primarily Alan Laxo and myself for a little bit, has been an invaluable resource in helping us understand what happened once we spray and whether we should spray again. The model will predict what percentage of the fruits on the tree will drop and what percent will persist. The difficulty is that the model requires manual measuring the diameter of fruitlets twice over a four to five day period, starting three days after the spray and ending about seven days after the spray. The difference in their di diameter between the first measurement, three days after the spray, and seven days after the, the second measurement, seven days after the spray, helps us categorize how many fruits will drop and how many fruit will stay on the tree. This uh, then <clears throat> requires these uh, five steps, I guess I mislabeled the last one, but it requires the grower to physically count the total number of flowers clusters on each of five trees. And we have this rule that we do not count bloom on one year wood. So I wanted to comment, Mike's results show that often this model overestimated how much thinning because sometimes those fruits on one year wood continue to hang on. We try to thin them all off, but if some of them hang on, we end up with more fruits than what the model estimates that we would have. Once you make those initial counts of the entire tree, then we tag 15 spurs on each of those trees. And then after we sprayed, three days after application, we spray, we, we measure every one of those fruitlets on 15 tag spurs on five trees, which totals to 375 measurements. And then we wait four days and remeasure again. And based on that, we calculate the percent of persisting fruits. Now in the last, well, we've been using this model, I don't remember, maybe 10 years now. And, people get tired of the measuring and frustrated. So we've thought of different ways we could simplify it. Now there's four simplifications that we've done to this model, which maybe Dwayne Green doesn't agree with all of them, but they're just sort of ways to try to make it not so onerous to use the model. The first is that we discarded the need to keep track of the order of fruitlets within each cluster. So initially we would label each fruit look like you see in this bottom picture, one, two, three, four, and five. And then we would measure them in that same order every time. And that made people frustrated to have to find where's fruit two and where's fruit three. And so now we just measure them in any order and behind the scenes, we rank them within the cluster from the biggest to the smallest each time to run the model. But the grower does not need to keep track of the order they're measured. The second thing we've done is develop this degree day way to decide when to make the first measurement and when to make the second measurement. Because it turns out that in cool years, you should make your first measurement say on day three, but you should wait about six days to the second measurement. In hot years, you can make the first measurement on day two and make the second measurement on day six. But by doing degree days, we can consistently measure these at the right time. So we suggest that you wait till 50 degree days have elapsed after the spray and make your first measurement. And then wait till 100 degree days after application to make the second measurement. Now this number I've changed a little bit in the last year or two because I used to say, wait till 120 degree days, but by then sometimes it was too late to make another application. So I've shortened it to the 100 degree days. And then the last thing we've done is if you use the online, not the online, the phone app version, the Malusim version, 
We've included error detection protocols to eliminate the problem that I see repeatedly when growers send me data, and that is an error in, up in typing in the data or error in measurement that gives excessively large growth rates, and that will overestimate how much thinning you did. So now I have error protocols built in to the malus inversion to correct that. <clears throat> now going back to this uh, output of the newel model, let's suppose you chose to spray on this day on May 26th, when you had exactly 200 degree days from bloom, and it's a good timing. We would then wait till 50 more degree days have accumulated till we got to 250 and then make our first measurement. Now, because it's so cool, after application, it's one, two, three, four, five days before we measure. But by using the 50 degree, de uh, degree days to time your first measurement, you will get the proper timing and then you wait till 100 have passed before you make the second measurement. Now I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about the Malusim version of the fruit growth rate model. When you, log, when you download the app and you open it up, one of the first things it will ask you to do is to put in the base numbers for the block you're trying to predict thinning. And so you have to choose how many trees you're gonna be measuring, how many clusters, and the typical recommendation is five trees, 15 clusters per tree, and then there's generally five fruitlets in each cluster that told you had to multiply that out and it's 375 fruits. Then we said you had to count the total number of flower clusters on each of five trees. And in this particular case, they varied from as low as 58 on tree two to 101 on tree three, and the average was 75. So 75 average flower clusters times five gives you that that tree had a potential of 376 fruits, but the grower has decided he only needs 85 fruits to have a, a full crop. Then you go out and you measure. And here you can see is the way the data is entered on this. You can enter it on your phone out in the field while you're measuring. It has across the top tree one, two, three, four, and five. And then when you collect, select on each tree, it has cluster one, two, three, four through cluster 15. And this is the second measurement. And it says, when you measured the first time, there was only three fruitlets in cluster one, there was four in cluster two, there's four, 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 and three and four. And so it automatically will pre-populate all the fruitlets with how many it was before. And then you enter the new number as you measure it. If you don't like it, you can clear all the measurements, but this is the way you enter it. There's also a phone recognition piece to this. If you wanna just say the number, it should recognize it, but you have to double check that it correctly heard or could understand what you said and it put it in the right cell. But once you do that, then the model will run and you end up with this sort of a uh, output. I just put in here, this was a, a Honeycrisp block from 2021. The grower wanted 85 fruits and measured the first time on June 1st, the second time on June 4th. So only three days between uh, measurements. On June 1st, the average size was 6.3 and on June 4th, it was 8.4. Based on all the fruitlets measured, it already calculated that from the 376 original fruits around the tree, that petal fall spray knocked off most of them and there was only 109 left and the target was 83, 85. So we got very close to the target in just one spray. Why was that? Because in Western New York, it was warm at petal fall. And in fact, almost all the thinning in Western New York came from the petal fall sprays last year. At 10 millimeters, it was much cooler and we got very little thinning. And that's the value of using both a carbohydrate model and this Malusim fruit growth rate model. So in this case, I told the grower, stop. You've got a few more fruits than you while I want, but if you thin again, you might over thin. So best to hand thin off about uh, 20 fruits, um, 24 fruits per tree. There also is a button here where you want to see view model data. If you click that button, it will bring up this table that I have pasted in the bottom here. For each one of the two dates of measurement, June 1st and 4th, it'll show you the diameter of the largest fruits, 10 millimeters of the largest fruits, whereas the mean was only six. But then at the second time, the biggest fruits were 14 and the average of all was eight. So these biggest fruits are the ones that grow 
fastest. And then it shows you that the, the biggest crew grew four millimeters over those three days. And so half of that is two millimeters. And then it tells you how many are going to drop off and the predicted fruit set. Graphically, it shows you the same up there. So I want to finish with just a little bit of thoughts about this fruit growth rate model. It's one of the greatest tools that we have now in our toolbox to help manage precision thinning. I preach and preach and preach, go measure fruits. It's not that big a deal. It'll help you be so much more confident. Before this, people and the carbohydrate model, people would tell me their stomach would be in knots all through thinning season, hoping they didn't over thin. But the use of these two models have given them a sense of confidence and calm as they go through thinning. The problem is it's time consuming and tedious and people get tired of doing that. And so sometimes I have a convert who will start thin, uh, measuring fruitless for a couple of years and then pretty soon I check with them and they're not doing it anymore. So I realize that that's a serious limitation to the use of the model. The second problem is I continue to find every time I look at grower data or even our own errors in measurement, either when they typed it into the spreadsheet or when they measured it. And so without me going through meticulously and looking for errors, I didn't trust anybody to use this model without me double checking them. However, now with the error detection method, uh, tools that we have in our uh, new version of the MalUSIM phone app, I feel more confident that you can use this model without me fearing you get the wrong answer because of errors. So the solutions are this cell phone, uh, well, there are three possible solutions coming down the pike. A number of people said, why can't we use cell phone to, uh, the fruits and have them, the cell phone have an app that would calculate the diameter rather than us having to measure it with a caliper. That's being done by two companies which we're working with on this not large SCRI project in which you can take pictures of the fruitlets and then send them to one of these two companies and they will calculate the percent drop instantaneously for you. We're working with both of them the Fruit Scout company, you uh, take a picture of each fruitlet. You hold a small card next to it that's got a, a symbol on it. So it uses that as a reference to determine how to measure the fruit. And then you go back and take a second picture four days later or five days later, and it will calculate the growth rate. So, but it's still a job because you got to take 375 pictures each time and send, upload them to this company. The second company called Farm Vision uses a slightly different approach in which they take a video going down the row, tree to tree, and they can do that in day, you know, the first time and then repeat it and match up the fruits and calculate the fruit growth rate. I know that Fruit Scout is selling a commercial service this year to any grower that wants it to take pictures and use their system to use the fruit growth rate model. I think Farm Vision is also selling or beginning to sell a service to do the same thing. And we're trying to look at both of them and determine how we feel about both of them. But I would say, if you really don't wanna measure fruitlets, contact one of these two companies and see if you can work with them using your cell phone. The second approach is, to, is Todd Einhorn's idea for Michigan State to actually go pick 200 fruits, put them on a scanning a light table and scan their diameter using computer vision. And do that twice and you can get the same answer. A third idea came from Tom Kahn in which you there's a particular instrument that you can look at the reflectance of specific wavelengths of all the fruits on the tree and the ones that are going to fall have different reflectances and so you could categorize fruits that way. So in conclusion what I'd like to take home from this is that the Malusim model whether it's the new version or the MalUSIM phone app version is essential to predict thinning efficacy before you put the chemical in the tank. And it's also extremely useful to warn you when there will be excessive thinning and over thinning, and then you avoid thinning on those days. It's available free on either NUA or at MalUSIM.com. It's easy to use and should be run on a daily basis during the thinning season. Secondly, the fruit growth rate model, I think is a wonderful tool to determine what happened after you put the thinning spray on to allow a more informed decision on the next thinning spray. 
It's not available on NUA. The only place it's available is at malusim.com in some in a computer version. But it's still even tedious because it requires manual measurements of fruit diameter. But I'm excited that improved methods to get that fruit diameter measurement and then plug into the model are on the way, and they're going to make this whole uh, effort to, to use a fruit growth rate model much less tedious. With that, I'll conclude and thank you for your attention and be happy to discuss this at the end when we, or now, whatever you choose, Mike, as we move forward. All right, thank you, Terrence. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Robinson again. In this presentation, I want to talk a little bit about what we suggest you do to manage thinning this year in 2022 but also talk about the future and where we hope we're going to get to in the next few years, bringing computer vision into the equation to try to help us accomplish thinning in a precise way. So just as a review, precision crop load management is a strategy or a series of strategies to try to manage the number of apples on each tree to an exact number to obtain the best possible outcome. And as we've mentioned many times before in presentations, there's really three opportunities to influence fruit number per tree, and that's through pruning. Each time we cut off a branch, we're throwing some buds on the ground. Secondly, through chemical thinning, starting at bloom and carrying all the way on to 18 to 20 millimeters. And then lastly, by hand thinning. In this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on the chemical thinning part of that three-pronged strategy to manage crop load. So the very first step in precision crop load management is you have to establish a target of the number of fruits you want to harvest from each tree. It sounds easy, but it's not as easy if you do it with a lot of thought. You have to identify this target or goal based upon fruit size and yield and on the potential that that orchard has in the particular climate that you live in. I show here two pictures of orchards. The first one is an orchard of tall spindle that is fully developed. The canopy is tall, 11 to 12 feet tall, fully filled in. The second one is a equally aged orchard, but the canopy hasn't filled in, particularly in the top part of the tree. These two orchards have different potential in terms of the number of fruits that each tree should carry. So for in the first example, I said, I think that orchard could probably carry 1200 bushels of Honeycrisp per acre at 80 count. And so at the spacing, which is three by 11, 1,320 trees to the acre, it should have 73 fruits. But the second orchard, because it's not filled in in the upper part of the canopy as well, I said should only carry 800 bushels at 80 count fruit, same number of trees per acre, so it should carry only 48 fruits per tree. Every grower has to be realistic when they decide how many fruits the tree should carry and we rely on your experience with that orchard and how well you feel it has filled its space to determine how many apples the tree should carry. Then when we come to the thinning period, we try to use the stepwise approach that I described in my previous talk to manage the thinning process to stepwise reduce the number of fruit through sequential applications using the pollen tube growth model first then the carbohydrate model and the fruit growth rate model to guide post bloom thinning sprays and determine whether we want to reapply any spray or not. This is again the model that we tend to use and how we think about it logically going forward. I want to comment just briefly that bloom thinning, although it's not highly accepted in the eastern US yet, I think is essential. And I wanted to make a couple of comments about the two most common caustic chemicals that are used in bloom thinning. And Mike in his presentation talked about both of them. They both are caustic chemicals, meaning that they burn the pistol, the stigmatic surface of the pistol. They also are caustic in that they can uh, result in mild leaf phytotoxicity, but ATS generally has very little effect on fruit finish. 
whereas lime sulfur also can have very little effect on fruit finish, but in wet years, it can result in some rusty. Both chemicals <clears throat> to be successful require two to three applications during that short period of seven to 10 days during full bloom. But when these chemicals are used with a pollen tube growth model, you can do a substantial portion of the thinning job right then at bloom. Now, ammonium thiosulfate is not registered legally as a thinner that would classify it as a pesticide, but it is a foliar nitrogen fertilizer because it's an ammonium fertilizer. And so it can legally be used in New York state when you apply it not as a thinner, but as a foliar fertilizer, recognizing that a secondary effect is to thin some of the crop. We've shown repeatedly that it's very good in return, improving return bloom of honeycrisp because it generally kills seeds or doesn't allow seeds to develop through fertilization so that we don't have as much GA produced by those seeds which inhibit flowering. Lime sulfur has to have an oil penetrant mixed with it. We've done studies with lime sulfur alone and get very little thinning. But when oil is mixed with it, it is a potent thinner. And it seems to have more what I call reach back potential that it can kill pollen tubes growing down the style better than ATS. Any oil will tend to work. We tend to, uh, we've tested several of them. Fish oil seems to give slightly better result than do other oils. And so we recommend that where you can get it. Plus, if you use a fish oil, you can use it in organic production. <clears throat> but it's not registered in New York. Even though it's registered as a fungicide, the current lime sulfur company labels prohibits its use during bloom because the company's afraid of bad effects from This is the product that is used almost 100% in Western orchards. They have great success with it, but they have drier weather. And so they don't get russeting. Here it works well when the year is dry, but it's problematic when the year is wet. <clears throat> this is some data we did many, many, many years ago. But I just wanted to point out in an unthin control, we had 288 apples on the tree with either ATS or lime sulfur with fish oil in this case, we dropped that down to 150 to 180 fruits. So they both thin. <clears throat> now this was with no additional thinning sprays at all. If petal fall or 10 millimeters, this is strictly what we got out of the bloom thinning. And numerically size was increased, but it was not significantly different. We compared in this study, several different oils, fish oil, and lime, well, I wanted to compare fish oil and lime sulfur at full bloom versus ATS at full bloom, and it did not give any difference in thinning. They both thin similarly. When we looked at different oils, fish oil versus ultrafine oil versus vegetable oil versus regulated versus silhouette, there was no significant difference in thinning. However, the fish oil tended to give larger size than a couple of the cases compared to other oils. <clears throat> that data is still good. And we also saw in those studies back in 2004 when we did these trials with Honeycrisp that we tended to get more return bloom with Honeycrisp. And so you see here an untreated control had only about 10% return bloom. Just the ATS at full bloom raised it up to about 45% return bloom. The standard sort of post bloom chemical sprays of NAA or 7. Maxellan 7 tended to work fairly well, about similar to ATS, but when we combine Maxellan ATS, we got the best return bloom at 75%. That's led us to continue to recommend to growers to use ATS at bloom. Back in the days of 2004, we didn't have the pollen tube growth model, so we were just applying at 80% bloom. <clears throat> now with the pollen tube growth model, we should be able to more precisely time them. But nevertheless, I want to emphasize that many growers come back to me and say that as soon as they started using ATS every year, they were able to finally control biennial bearing of Honeycrisp. Now, unfortunately, Mike did that first study in the Champlain Valley on a year with drought. And the drought did relimit return bloom for many varieties, 
but especially Honeycrisp and Ida Red in New York. But I think in a more normal year, we'll see some consistent positive effects of ATS. And is one of the reasons why I prefer ATS over NAA at full bloom with Honeycrisp. Now you can spray any one of the four hormone type thinners at bloom. And I list here who, you know, the promalin types, the Maxell types, the fruit tone types, uh, amethyn, but they all are very, very mild thinners and they don't tend to improve return bloom as much as ATS. <clears throat> so my suggestions for bloom thinning is use the pollen tube growth model. I think it's a great addition, but use ATS. That's really the only legal one in New York. If you're listening from another state where lime sulfur and oil is legal, you can spray that. And I like that particularly on biennial bearing varieties like Honeycrisp, Fuji, Evercrisp, and Delicious. However, for more annual varieties, I think you can do just almost as well with a hormone type thinner like Gala, Snapdragon, Empire, Macallan, Pink Lady. Two cautions. We suggest you not spray the caustic thinners under slow drying and wet conditions or if there's frost. Wherever you had frost, there's some damage to the wax layers of the fruit and these chemicals get on the fruit underneath the wax and cause russety. I want to now focus just on some of the options for post-bloom chemical thinners. For petal fall, the options are seven alone, or amethyst alone, or maxellin seven, or NA and seven, or maxellin NA. And in the near future, we hope this new chemical that's not yet labeled, but should be labeled in one to two years called Metametron. Its trade name will be named Brevis. The highlighted one, NAN7, is the one that I like the best out of all of those options. At the main thinning window of 10 to 12 to 13 millimeters, we generally use the combinations of hormone thinners and seven. So NAN7, Maxellon7, Maxellon NA. But in the near future, in fact, in 2022, a new product named ACC, which is trade named Exceed, will be available in several states as a fully registered product, but in New York, it probably will not receive New York label, so it will probably be sold and on a um, experimental use type of uh, program. And the newer product, which is not available yet, called Metametron. For the last spray, if needed, we have struggled in the past to get any thinner to work when fruits are 15 to 20 millimeters. I put an A and seven on the list, but it almost doesn't do anything. The plant loses sensitivity to NAA very quickly once fruits pass 15 millimeters, but we've had better success with Maxell and seven with a pint of oil mixed as a surfactant. That's where we've gotten the best thinning from this late timing. Ethyl also with oil can give thinning, but the real exciting thing is these two new products, ACC, combined with Maxell or Metametron, both thin when fruits are big and will be great additions to our toolbox once we have them and learn how to use them. So for example, on Honeycrisp, I would suggest the following. Start with some two ATS sprays at, at uh, Bloom with two and a half percent, then follow that with an NA and seven at Petal Fall based upon the carbon balance model sometime uh, between 100 and 130 degree days. Follow that with a, another spray of NAN7, slightly lower rate when fruits are 10, 11, 12, 13 millimeters. And if needed, then this Maxell 7 and oil for now, or this ACC plus Maxell or Metametron, which I think will be better than the standard Maxell 7 and oil. So for success in 22 in chemical thinning, I suggest the following. Every block needs a proper assessment of flower quality. How many spurs are flowering? Is it only 25? Is it 50%? Is it 75% or 100% of the spurs flowering? And then whether or not the king flower is present and undamaged or is missing. If king flowers are missing, then I don't like to blossom thin. I'd rather wait and attack it in petal fall and 10 millimeters. But if the kings are present, I think you have to blossom thin and generally use full rates, but follow the carbohydrate model. T 
time your thinning sprays based upon degree days, as we mentioned in the earlier, proto, uh, earlier presentation. And use the fruit growth rate model between each spray to assess the real impact of that thinning spray. Two little practical suggestions in number three and four. I'd like to nozzle the sprayer differently for each spray. When we're spraying at bloom with ATS, for example, the goal is to have every flower on that tree get some ATS on the pistol itself to burn it. Therefore, I like to have uniform nozzling from the top to the bottom. But for the hormone type sprays at petal fall 10 millimeters and 18 millimeters, we tend to always over thin the bottom. So we start adjusting the amount of chemical applied to the different parts of the tree. So at petal fall, I like to nozzle it with only one third of the spray chemical hitting the bottom half of the tree and two thirds directed towards the top of the tree. But once we get to the 12 millimeter spray, I nozzle it even differently where almost all the spray is in the top very little in the bottom. And if we spray ever at the 18 millimeters, I spray only the top of the tree. Now, some growers like to use surfactants like Regulate and Regulate with NAA makes a big difference. You can get much more thinning out of NAA with Regulate. But on the other hand, if you're spraying in kind of dangerous conditions and there's possible over thinning, you will get over thinning if you put Regulate in with NAA. Thus, I'd like to suggest a couple of rules. If with the carbohydrate model, there's no deficit predicted when you're going to spray, then I don't mind putting Regulate in. It probably will help you. But if there's a carbohydrate deficit predicted, I would never include Regulate in the mix. Oil is another surfactant that is very powerful. And the only time I think it's justified in the spray, uh, chemical thinning sprays is at the 18 millimeters with what we used to have available. With these two new chemicals, it will not be necessary to add oil on any of the sprays. <clears throat> I've talked repeatedly in the last year, but I emphasize for this audience that with Honeycrisp, we are expecting in 2022 a high bloom. And therefore, blossom thinning is essential for Honeycrisp because the ATS can reduce the number of seeds and these excess numbers of seeds on a high bloom year is what causes biennial bearing because they produce gibberellins, which inhibit flowering. And blossom thinning is the best way to remove or kill those excess seeds before they cause damage. I will mention that an alternative, which a few growers in Washington do, is to hand thin at full bloom. Go out there with, by pinching out all the little flowers except one on every cluster. It's very time consuming, very expensive, but some people do it on vast acreages with an army of people because it is an absolutely sure way to eliminate biennial bearing on Honeycrisp. The reason why it's so important with Honeycrisp is its flower initiation happens very early in mid-June, whereas most of the other varieties, the flower initiation for the next year happens later in July or even early August. Therefore, early thinning, getting the fruit number down to the reasonable number, reducing total seeds on the tree to a reasonable number becomes very important with Honeycrisp. Now, we've recommended for many years return bloom sprays with NAA or ethyl. And this is a slide from a different presentation I decided to throw in just to make the point that because Honeycrisp blooms so early, or not blooms, sets its flower buds for next year so early, Often when we spray these summer NAA or ethyl sprays, we're too late. So we're suggesting an earlier timing for these return bloom sprays. And on my last point on this slide, I have the recommendation, start spraying ethyl at 10 day intervals when fruits are only 16 millimeters big. Used to be we waited until they were maybe 25 to 30 millimeters to start. But this earlier timing will help induce flowering on honeycrisp trees. The risk is ethyl can thin at that time. Therefore, the second caution. The first two sprays should be at a moderate rate and should not be applied when temperatures are over 85 degrees Fahrenheit. You have to find a two or three day window when temperatures are moderate to put on these ethyl sprays. So a sort of spray program we would recommend for good flower formation and thinning of Honeycrisp would be start at bloom with two ATS sprays, 
then at petal fall with an NA plus seven spray, then at eight to 12 millimeters, another NA and seven spray, and then beginning these four return bloom sprays of ethereal with a low rate on the first one when they're 15, 16, 17 millimeters, and then the higher rate for the later ones when they're 25, 35 or, or larger fruit size. The take home messages in terms of crop load management are you have to remember that pruning is a piece of the puzzle. And we, were not, we didn't talk about it that in this presentation, but we suggest that you prune to a target bud number, but you wait till green tip or half inch green so that you can see how many buds are on that tree and you don't prune a tree that has light bloom. But then to use the precision chemical thinning program we discussed using two sprays of ATS followed by the pollen tube, using the pollen tube growth model to time it. Then Pelifol and other sprays guided by the carbohydrate model with an assessment <clears throat> of the results using the fruit growth rate model. Then apply these return bloom sprays starting at 16 millimeters and then hand thin as early as possible to get the fruit numbers down so that you can get flower bud initiation. I want to end with just some few slides and comments about where we're headed. This whole concept of precision crop load management starting to seem too complex, too much effort, <clears throat> takes too much time. So we've had a dream for a number of years if we could automate some of this using computer vision, robots, maybe it would not be so onerous. So we're working with several companies to develop autonomous vehicles with computer vision to run up and down the rows and count at different times of the season what is out there on a tree by tree basis. <clears throat> we think that if we count dormant buds, we can adjust pruning to based on the number of dormant buds. If we count floral buds at green tip to pink, we can then come back and reprune or adjust pruning before bloom. If we count flowers at bloom, it will adjust our blossom thinning. <clears throat> and then fruitlets later will help us determine how close we are to the target number. A second piece that we're working on is trying to figure out a way to then convey information that this rover would acquire through computer vision back to the human worker. So I have a picture here of a Google Glass. We envision workers either wearing earbuds or something like this glass in which as they approach each tree, information on that tree would be communicated them in audible form in a, with a uh, ear, earbuds or visually in, in Google Glass to tell them what to do in terms of pruning or in terms of thinning. Lastly, there's a picture of a tractor with a prototype a smart sprayer in which <clears throat> we could drive it up and down the rows and it would hit certain clusters with say ATS or another caustic chemical to thin those and not hit others. And it would adjust it tree by tree by tree based upon the data that the rover would collect. So the focus of this project is to first assess how many buds are out there, how many fruitlets are out there, and then do something about it early in the season. And both guiding pruning, guiding chemical thinning, and guiding hand thinning. <clears throat> the problem that we have with our current protocols is it's time consuming and tedious. But secondly, when you count in the dormant season, it's hard to distinguish between floral buds and vegetative buds. But a third problem comes just from human uh, fatigue. The accuracy of manual counts varies considerably from person to person and with the time of day. And we found that growers just quickly tire of all this manual counting. <clears throat> now, second problem is that there's a lot of variability in an orchard. We tell people go count five representative trees, but if you map that tree of all the, how big all the trunks are in that acre, there's a whole range. Some are big, some are small. The bigger trunk tree should have more apples than the smaller trunk trees. And all the orchards look uniform, there is considerable variability. Thus, each tree should have a different optimum crop load. But if we can use this computer vision, we can record data from every single tree, store it, process it, 
and then hopefully communicate it back to the grower with this georeferencing of each tree <clears throat> to allow individual tree management. So that's where we hope we're headed with this big SERI project. Uh, a rover has been built. It turns out there's about three other companies in the world that are similarly building ATV mounted sensors that can count. And we're trying to work with all of them to then build into their systems a way to not only acquire the information, but communicate it back to the grower. <clears throat> Lastly, I just mentioned that it's not so easy as it sounds. When you look at what the camera sees at different times, they're very different. And for a camera to identify pink flower clusters is very different from the camera to identify 20 millimeter fruits. And so you have to have very robust but distinct artificial intelligence guided computer vision at each time as we go through this thinning window. <clears throat> now, we do think a lot about how are we going to communicate this back to growers. Now, at the simplest level, if we were to map the orchard with one of these rovers, we could produce a map like you see here on the left showing areas of the orchard with higher bloom and areas with lower bloom. This is helpful when a manager can get this kind of map, he can then try to figure out how to address it. But even better would be to convey actionable information to the human worker on the specific crop load management for a specific tree during both dormant pruning and hand thinning. And also to link that information to smart sprayers that would spray trees differently based upon the number of fruits that tree should have. Ultimately, it would be wonderful if we could have uh, robots that would do the crop load management for us. And that's a long-term goal that may not happen in this current project. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions, but I hope I've given you a sense of what to do in 2022 with the tools we have, but also what I hope that you'll have available to you in the next three to four years. All right, great. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you for a wonderful overview there. I don't see any new questions in the chat box, but if people do have them, please go ahead and type them in there. We are still running a little short on time, so I think I'm going to invite our next speaker up. Uh, but again, if you do have questions, feel free to type those in, in the chat box and we can address them there. And again, we do have 10 minutes at the end of the meeting to take questions then as well. So with that, I'd like to invite up our next speaker. Dr. Pollyanna Francescato. And Pollyanna is a global technical development specialist on PGRs with Valen Biosciences. And she's been doing a great deal of work on their new PGR material Exceed. So we're certainly looking forward to learning more about that. Thanks, Mike. Can you see my screen? Full screen? Yep, it's full screen. You're good to go. Thanks, Polly. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks for inviting me to speak. It, it made me feel very special because of my beautiful history at Cornell and uh, at Cornell in New York and New York growers hold a very special place in my heart. So thank you very much about, for inviting me. So we'll, today we're going to talk about ACC. As Terence just mentioned there, ACC is the active ingredient in uh, Exceed. Uh, Exceed is actually a new apple and stone fruit thinner. I gave a similar talk at the IFTA meeting last month. Uh, we talked about ABA and ACC there, but today I'll just talk about ACC. So before we go uh, into the ACC, I'd like to just to brief uh, show you these slides so you understand where ACC actually is placed. So plant hormones, um, and, and PGRs, plant growth regulators, it, they regulate several processes in plants. They have several roles, as you can see here in each square, in plant growth and development. The difference between plant hormone and plant regulators is that a plant hormone is net, uh, plant hormone, hormones are naturally occurring compounds in, within the plant, while the PGR itself, the plant growth regulators, are either naturally occurring or synthetic produced, synthetic produced. So every plant hormone is a PGR, but not every PGR is a plant hormone. We have today about nine plant hormones that have been discovered, but I added here only the major five, which is the gibberellins, the cytokinins, 
the the auxins and the ethylene and abscisic acid. Just me get my pointer here. So uh, in general, we could say that within the plant, auxins, gibberellins, and cytokines are home hormones that are promoting, they're inducing growth because of their role on cell division expansion. Of course, if you change the rate, you may be causing another effect to the plant. But then abscisic acid and ethylene, those two last ones here, are the hormones that are usually part of the senescence and the maturity process. And of course, also the stress response, for instance, the abscisic acid. But they can have different responses depending on the, the rate used or even the phenological states, uh, stage of the plant when they are applied. If you apply too early, like for instance, NAA, if you apply NAA too early, you are promoting thinning. If you apply close to harvest, actually you are keeping the fruit on the tree is the opposite effect. So there's different, uh, different effects. So today we only gonna be speaking, be talking about one class, uh, which is the ethylene. But in fact, we're gonna be talking about ACC, which is the precursor of of uh, ethylene. So what is ACC then? ACC is the short name and sweet name for one amino cyclopropane carboxylic acid. It is the active ingredient in exceed, is a naturally occurring non-protein amino acid present in all plants. It's not considered a plant hormone yet, though, though there, are, there are some papers and uh, mentioning that there is a uh, ACC is responsible, responsible for a specific roles in plant, but is not yet considered a plant hormone. And it is, as I said, it is the immediate precursor to, to ethylene. So when we spray ACC to the plant, it's going to be rapidly converted to ethylene by, by the ACC oxidase uh, enzyme. But it can also be conjugated in three other. Uh, 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 things in the plant, but we only talk about the, we are not going to be talking about them because they are of no um, biological importance. So as I said before, uh, in the first slide I gave, it's a plant hormone that responds for plant senescence. Ethylene is a plant hormone responsible for it, plant senescence and maturation. So what are the, the, the what ethylene, ethylene does to the plant then? If ACC is the precursor, so at the end of the response is gonna be based on the ethylene production. So it triggers uh, ripening senescence, it causes leaf and fruit abscission, increases radicoloration. How many of you have sprayed ethylene on apples to get co better color on grapes? Ethylene is responsible for increasing radicoloration and also induces flowers to form. Terence just mentioned about the summer sprays with ethylene to improve uh, return bloom. So basically what ethylene is actually the plant hormone responsible for, for that specific uh, uh, factor to improve the return bloom. So basically ACC is the precursor of the ethylene production. We talked about ethylene, but what are the differences between ethylene and, um, and the ACC? So ACC, as I said before, when you apply it to the tree, is rapidly converted into ethylene by ACC oxidase uh, using the plant's natural biochemical pathways. So actually, when you apply ACC, the plant is going to have the total control on the ethylene production. The, it's the opposite with ethylene because when you apply ethylene, actually, or Basically, you are giving ethylene to the plant. So the plant does not have control in the ethylene production. Ethylene is going to degrade and releases ethylene once entering the plant cytoplasm. That's the difference between the two compounds. ACC is a more reliable fruit thinner at higher temperatures. Why I'm saying that? So we did some lab studies. This is back three, seven years ago, well, seven years ago, three years ago, seven years ago, where we studied on cotton and we actually repeated the same study this past year, we, we found the same results. We repeated on apples. But what we did, we sprayed the plants. This is the ethylene level. You know, we spray ACC, you're gonna increase the ethylene production. And on, here you have the ethylene levels and here, we incubated the plants after spraying it into different temperatures, 25 Celsius and 35 Celsius which is around, I forgot to, to convert this, but it's, I think it's 80, both 80, 85. So what happened here, when you spray 
I have here my um, treated control in black. The gray is my etaphone and a blue is my ACC. So the, when you spray at 25 Celsius, you have the same amount of ethylene released by the plant. But when you spray at 35 Celsius, you see the amount of ethylene released by etaphone compared to ACC. So the plant actually somehow uses its own um, biosynthesis pathway, biochemical pathway to kind of control the, 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 the ethylene production of the plant. So it kind of shuts down. So that's why we say it's a more reliable fruit in at a higher temperatures. When we talk about um, stone fruit, if you apply ethylene to stone fruit, you're gonna cause gamosis to the tree. So ACC, we have not seen any gamosis. Uh, in, any, in any of the places we have tested. Also, the other difference, which is kind of plus for ACC, is because ACC leaves no residue um, at harvest. Actually, in the US, APA has granted a uh, tolerance exemption for exceed because we found that when we spray exceed on the plants, uh, the levels decline back to the uh, background levels very quickly. So you will find if it, you find ACC in plants anyways, even if you don't apply the chemical. So it's metabolized by the plants very quickly. Ethephone is the opposite because the problem we have, for instance, ethephone on grapes is because it leaves residue. So you, growers cannot sell fruit uh, grapes, for instance, to, to Europe because of that residue they can find. With ACC, it just degrades very quickly on the environment and within the plant as well. What are the current uses in agriculture? I know, uh, I know Anna and Louise is gonna be talking some of the trials they've done, but are there are three major uses for exceed uh, in, uh, that we have on the label. Just to make a comment that Terence mentioned about uh, registration, exceed is registered in, in the US, including New York, but uh, we're not gonna be able to sell, we're not selling products the years. You're gonna find, product to buy only next year. So you guys are going to have full registration. You already has full, uh, have full registration exceed. So it's going to be uh, registered. Uh, it is registered for stone fruit thinning. It's going to be the first ever commercial thinning product that's based on naturally occurring compound. So it's the only product is available for stone fruit. And when I talk of stone fruit, we have the label for peach and nectarines. Uh, apple fruit is going to be one more tool in the toolbox for the growers. It's a more reliable commercial product that we are targeting for late season. And then also we're going to have a label uh, uh, is not yet on the label, but uh, for some countries we're going to have the label for grape coloring. It's going to be another partner for Proton, which has the ABA, which promotes coloring. For both stone fruit and apple fruit, it's going to really uh, uh, be a game changer because it's going to help uh, reduce the expense of labor needed for hand thinning, especially now that we have a labor shortage and the labor costs are increasing. And stone fruit is going to be very unique in that case. Uh, how is ACC working when we apply? So what is the mode of action of, of for apple and stone fruit? We know the ethylene, the ethylene signaling triggers seed of your abortion and activation of the abscission zone at the base of the flower or fruit stem. What you see, what you're gonna see when you apply um, ACC exceed to the stone fruit, you're gonna see flower drop, start seeing flower drop already four or five days after applications. And that's, you're gonna, it, they're gonna continue dro uh, to drop for some time. And sometimes now, for instance, now I've been in California helping uh, growers with the, uh, with the, the grower experience program. And we are seeing in some varieties, it's still, the flowers are dropping senescence actually on the, on the tree for about three weeks after you apply. So it starts four or five days, but it's still, you're still gonna see some flower drop or even if it stays on the, on the, on the, on the hangers on the, on the branch. Plums, we've been doing some plums. You don't have the label yet, but you, could see even in two days after application, you can see some flowers and depending if you apply a pink, um, a balloon or bud, we call pink bud and, and peaches, but at popcorn stage, you're gonna see some flowers and popcorn uh, flowers already dropping two days, within the two days. We don't know, uh, I think there's two mode of actions here. One is promoting, the, uh, activating the abscission zone 
because we see that later in another one, uh, because we see this flower drop on the, on, the, on the ground already four days. And another one that what is happening, I, I will believe we're gonna find out now because we're working with some other researchers in Europe to understand more about the gene expression. But we believe that for those flowers that are falling later, maybe there is a uh, effect on the, on, the, on the seed, on the ovule actually, is aborting the ovules and then later on the flower is gonna drop anyways. And then in apples, what we've seen is not always the case, but we can observe a fruit drop as early as four or five days after application. You're gonna see, um, I'll show you the label. We're gonna be applying uh, targeting applications for a stone fruits gonna be around bloom. And in apples is around the 20, 15, 20 millimeters fruit size. You're gonna notice some leaf drop even if you apply a bloom, you're gonna see some very small leaves. If you see on the video here, you can see some small, le small leaves dropping. It really depends on the variety and on the location and uh, the weather, actually. We don't see very um, that often uh, in, the, in the stone fruit. That's why we're targeting actually the bloom applications. If you ask me, there is any effect on size? No effect on size. Actually, because we think earlier we're getting better size in stone fruit, there's no negative at all. Because especially because those small leaves, they drop anyways in two weeks, they start dropping. And apples, you also see, you're gonna see some leaf drop. Uh, it really, we thought about this difference between varieties, but it depends, it's really, we see the diff, uh, some blocks, even with the same variety, they, they some blocks are going to have leaf drop. Some blocks you're not going to see leaf drop. It's not we're not seeing a big deal with the leaf drop. So we saw a few blocks this year where we saw a substantial um, amount of leaf drop, but we're not too concerned at this point, just because of the timing of application. For apples, timing is going to. If you look at the label, the label will allow you to apply exceed it all the way from full bloom to 25 millimeters fruit size. So it has a, a wide range of the time is really um, it's a large. Uh, it's wide here from right. 25. Uh, why we done? Uh, I'll show you in the next slide that uh, some trials that were done in the U.S. were actually we compared applications from eight to 12, uh, eight to 12 to, and a 20 to 25 millimeter size. And actually the best efficacy within this window here from eight millimeters is, uh, it's most effective at the 15, 20 millimeter size. So that's where we're targeted because that's where we see more efficacy. If I go to Brazil, Brazil is dropping, can, uh, in Brazil, we are dropping fruit up to 30 millimeters fruit size in Gala, but we're not seeing that in the US. It's a totally different climate there. We have the lab for full bloom for petal fall, but we don't have any data yet to support applications at that time in the US. We do have data from other, uh, other countries. And if I look at the efficacy, we're starting to, uh, doing some full bloom applications now. And we see, it, we see thinning from full bloom, but when I look at the efficacy of the product when applied from petal fall to 25, I can see that the product, the um, uh, ACC is most affected at 15, 20 millimeters, and then petal fall, and then A12 millimeters. So there is more efficacy here, petal fall than A12. This is the trials we've done in other countries. So we're gonna do trials this year in the US. Uh, it's a new effective opportunity for growers. The rates are gonna be uh, from 200 to 400 ppm. Again, as for max cell and for, uh, for NAA, we see difference between varieties. Some varieties are, uh, respond better than others. So there's, we have to take that into account. Uh, this is the work I actually, it's from Cornell when I was there in 2000, I think it was 2017 when we did this work. Oh, the graph is on the left. And uh, with that, that, that our protocol that came from Valent, where here it shows exactly, this is fruit set in the top uh, part here. This is a gala fruit set. And you compare and treat it, and then 200 versus 400 applied at 10 millimeters fruit size and 200, 400 applied at 18 millimeter size. So the lower, uh, the lower the bars here, the more efficacy you get. So it's clear, you can see this clear that is more efficacious at the, at the later stage than 
later than 10 millimeters fruit size. And this is what you see everywhere in every other region as well. And of course, you get a fruit size increase, but it's directly related to thinning activities, not related to the product per se. Uh, this is just another, that's when ACC is applied by itself, but our, our goal here is having ACC in your toolbox. So it started early, started with your bloom application. Terrence talked a lot about that and then come back with petal fall. And then if you need it later, you can come back with exceed. So this, this is just to show some data uh, when uh, exceed was applied early after uh, NAA product at bloom, you don't get too much efficacy at that early stage. And then ACC applied after max cell applications during the A12 uh, millimeters. Then you see more efficacy from exceed at the later stage. So it's gonna be another tool in your box for your thinning program. Uh, we had some experiments, experiment uni, uh, used pro, uh, program last year, uni, in, in, in the US, in the entire, U, entire US. And um, we had, the, it was the first time we had actually, actually we did it large plot trials. And we had the, for apples, we had a lot of variability in thinning activity from ACC, especially in the East. We saw more thin actually coming from the West last year. And what we are addressing that is because maybe the applications were done too late. It's probably a, when fruitlets were bigger than 25 millimeters. And what we see is you have to target 15, 20 millimeters fruit size. Unless you have a carbohydrate depth at that stage, then you can and drop the fruitlet. Also, there's a lot of uh, variability in water volume used by the growers. And sometimes even we saw growers going with the 25 gallons per acre. We don't know yet uh, the, uh, about the translocation efficacy. If, uh, if the, we believe that you have to have good coverage for the product, but we're doing studies to confirm that. And as we saw, um, as I mentioned before, there's difference in thin activity among varieties, not just among varieties, but among years and among blocks but varieties does play a role here. So the upcoming studies, as we said, I said before, we're doing early applications earlier than, than 10 millimeters fruit size. We're doing tank mixing and Terence is doing some trials as well with combination he showed before. What if a you get, gets out and get banned, then we got an option, tank mixing XCC with Maxell. We're doing XCC, exceed with NAA, exceed with the, uh, Proton, there's several combinations that were used. And then also we're looking at other uses as well. For the stone fruit, the label, I'll go quick. I don't know how much stone fruit, I don't recall having stone fruit in Champlain, but the label is gonna allow, uh, the applications are going from pink bud all the way to petal fall. That's where we're gonna be applying exceed. That's where you see most of the efficacy from the product. Uh, the rates are a little bit higher than the apples, 300 to 600 ppm for peach and nectarines, and then we're working with plums and plums are more responsive uh, to ACC than peach and nectarines, and then we got to lower the rate for plums. Uh, here, what you, we're going to see, right you apply a bloom, you're going to see some flower senescence. So very two, two, three days after applications, you're going to see the ground full of petals, but that's not really an indication that you got a more or less thinning. Okay, the first effect, don't get confused because when I was working in California, the growers get very excited about seeing the leaf, the petal on the ground, but that doesn't mean that you got thinner or not. So you got to really wait and see the flowers on the ground. So it's going to, it's a natural process of actually getting that, get that in uh, leaf senescence there. This is just to show the, uh, what I said before, we have a unmet need, especially in the stone fruit to reduce uh, labor for hand thinning. I'm super excited with the stone fruit part because I've been working, the, this is the second year I'm out in California helping, uh, working directly with the growers on large plots. And uh, we got a lot of thinning this year. We didn't get any over thinning in, on none of the blocks. So it's a really exciting um, tool for them. And I just I put a graph here. This is from the, uh, we see that we need higher rates in, in, in California compared to the East, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, even, and I would include New York here, uh, where we went only with 300s in, in California. We probably wanna end up with the higher rates uh, for those varieties they have here. There's a lot of varieties that we cannot focus on all, all of them. 
but there is differences between varieties, as you can see here. Oh, but even though within the, uh, between varieties and then between plays, sometimes one same variety in one place has less tin than the other. So the weather plays, plays a role here. But in California, where we had on the same block planted at the same time different varieties, uh, you can see the difference between we get from five to 70% thinning. So there is a difference. I wish we could have just one rate for all varieties, but it's not going to happen that way. So this is what I have. I'm happy to take any uh, answer any questions you guys had. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Polly. We do have a question for you, and I was hoping you could clarify. Um, the The person asked, "Did I hear right that it won't be available for commercial use in 2022?" I no, no, no commercial, no, no sales in 2022. Okay, so you were saying it is currently registered in New York. Yes, but there won't be commercial sales. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And that's that's pretty much countrywide wide at this point. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions at the moment, but again, we do have that time at the end. Uh, so thank you again, Polly. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to go to our next speaker. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Luis Gonzalez Nieto. And uh, Dr. Okay. Luis Gonzalez Nieto is a postdoc in the Robinson Lab at Cornell. He has a great deal of experience working with Metametrin in Spain and in New York, and he's been doing quite a bit of investigating with it here in Geneva. And so he's going to be talking screen? about that. Sorry. Yep, it looks good, Luis. You're good to go. Okay, good. Good afternoon, everyone. I will talk about uh, trials uh, of Metametron in Spain and New York. First, uh, I want to show this slide because the uh, fruit thinning is a very complex process. Uh, the efficiency of, of free thinning can be influenced for the, for the cultivar, for the climate conditions, the cultural techniques, the history of the orchards, and the spraying conditions. However, however all these factors can be influenced for all this. It's a crazy time. There are a lot of factors can influence the efficiency of free thinning, and it's a very complex process. Uh, my presentation is divided in four points. The first, I will explain uh, the model of action. After, uh, I will explain the brevis efficacy at different fruit size and the determination uh, uh, with other conditions which influence uh, the efficacy of fruit thinning and the effect of different rates of thinning in Gala, Fuji, and Sweet Tango. And after the conclusion, okay, I will start. Brevis is the commercial name of Metamitron. Uh, it's a photosynthetic inhibitor. Okay, the model or the action mode is different of the other products. And this inhibition reduces the carbohydrate production by the tree and produces stress after and after the fruit farm. For you see better. Uh, this is a video, the, the production of photosimulates is the transfer of the photosimulates between the leaf and the fruit, and you can see all fruit receive photosimulates. Okay, this is a normal situation, and all fruits grow. However, uh, when you spray uh, metamitron, the production of photosimulates is lower, and, and uh, all photosimulates go and they go at the biggest fruits. At the end, the biggest fruits continue growing and the rest fall. Okay, this is a simulation. Usually, there are the efficiency of this product you I will explain uh, can be influenced for the climatic conditions. But this is a simulation, <laughs> it's a, the best situation. Okay, but how is the, the inhibition of metamitron? There are to a scenario, you can do one spray or two sprays. Uh, this bar is the day of a spray. In this case, this bar is eight millimeter spray, and this bar is the 10 millimeter spray. When you spray metamitron, uh, the maximum inhibition arrives two or four days after application, and the, the inhibition is between 40% and 50%. Okay, this, this maximum inhibition can be changed 
between years, okay? There are years, the inhibition is the 30%, but usually around the 50%. After this period, the tree go recovery is slowly, and after 20 days, the tree is, is fully, uh, fully recovered. When you do two sprays, okay, the maximum inhibition arrives in the same moment and, and with the first application, but when you do the second spray, the, 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 the maximum inhibition, the period of the maximum inhibition increased between eight and 10 days. After this period, the tree go recovery slowly. After 30 days, the tree is a fully recovery. The conclusion this part is the single application, the single baby application statement showed the maximum inhibition two, four days after, after application and recovery in 20 days. However, when there were two spies, the inhibition was maintained between eight and 10 days and recovery took in 13 days. Okay, the second part of this presentation is breast screening efficacy uh, at different food sites in Gala and Fuji. We did four experiments uh, between 2015 and 2016 in Gala. Uh, I spray uh, metamitron in different timings. You can see uh, I spray it in, in different fluid size between 6.5 between 6.5 millimeters and 21.5 millimeters. The rate of a spray was 1.3 pints and 1.75 pints with 100 gallons per acre. Uh, I sp this, this, is, this rate is the usual rate that we spray uh, this product in Spain. The maximum rate is, is this in the register, 1.75. And uh, we spray the, the usual rate uh, for this cultivars. And we compare it, all the statements with Hanfi. Okay, this is the result, is the average, the all trials. And you can see the maximum efficiency of metamitron is in the range between 11.5 millimeters and 14 millimeters. This is the maximum efficiency or the maximum efficiency uh, of metamitron. But uh, you can see there are attendants that when increase the, the, the fruit diameter, you can see the 6.5 millimeters. When increase the fruit diameter, the efficiency increase. When arrive the maximum uh, the maximum efficiency, efficiency moment, after this period, the efficiency decreases. okay? I, I want to say that in, in this trial, we only spray one, uh, a single spray of metamitron, and was necessary a hand thing for a right, the, the, the ideal crop load. Okay, this table shows that there are difference between cultivar, this is a number of fruits per tree. You can see the Fuji show higher number of fruits uh, after application metamitron in comparison Gala. At the end, the efficiency of metamitron is higher in, in Gala. There are differences between cultivars. When you see uh, the, the difference between years, you can see in 2015, the, the number of fruits is lower in comparison 2016. At the end, there are differences between years. This difference is because this product can be influenced for, for, for the temperatures. This is the, center, the Celsius, I'm sorry for not change this, this scale, but the box is the period of spray between six and 20 millimeters. And this line is the average of temperatures in 2015. When we compare the temperatures with 2016, you can see the temperatures always was lower in 2016. For the reason, the efficiency of metamitron was lower this year in comparison 2015. Okay, this is the year with higher efficiency, with, uh, with the variety with higher uh, susceptibility in 2015, and the, and the comportment is the same. Okay, in, in this case, we, we, we see we have the same crop load in comparison with with the hand thinning in the, in the ranges between nine millimeters and 19 millimeters, okay? All these treatments have efficiency of metamitron, but if you see the treatment after the treatment 6.5, when increase the fruit diameter and the efficiency increase, when we arrive the maximum moment of the, of the, of the maximum sensibility of the fruit is, is in the same moment the, in, in, the, in the fruit diameters between 11.5 and 14 millimeters. After this size of fruit, the efficiency of metamitron is lower 
okay? And in this size, we, we don't have efficiency. And the conclusion of this point, this point brevi in effect was to turn a king fruit diameter from nine and 19 millimeters with the maximum efficacy observed in the 11.5 and 14 millimeter range. Okay, the, the, next, the next point of this presentation is the, what is the best in the, the K environmental data to explain the brevis efficacy year to year. For this, we evaluate 27 trials between 2013 and 2016 in Gala. The rate of spray in all these points was 1.3 pints with 100 gallons acre. And we evaluate the flowering of the year and all these variables, okay? Evapotranspiration, relative humidity, radiation, temperature, but the temperature, we evaluate the daily temperature, night temperature, the wind speed in range in periods of three days and five days, okay? Between eight days before spray and eight days after spray. We put all these all these variables in the same analysis at the end, the best important factor is the night temperature for explaining the efficiency of metamitron. Okay, the model select the flowering, the flower cluster per tree. Okay, when we have higher number of flowers, the number, the final of number, the final number of fruits in harvest is higher, is a logical. And the night temperatures, uh, five days before spray and three days after the spray was the best important time for, uh, for explaining the efficiency of metamitone. And when increase the temperature, the number of fruit is lower and, and the efficiency of metamitone is higher. And the conclusion, the final of number of fruit per tree was positively related with the initial flower cluster per tree. The nice temperatures in the period of five days before application and three days after application is the best we have a variable for predict uh, of the final fruits number. I want to say of this point that the, the, the last year we evaluate the Malusin model and it's a good tool for predict the efficiency of metamitron. And, but uh, this, this analysis go in the same line of, of the Malusin. And the last part of this presentation, I evaluate the relationship between dose and Bravi's efficacy. Okay, the first was in the first part, it was in Europe in four years between 2015 and 2016 in Gala. We evaluate uh, five different rates, okay, uh, in the timing in, uh, between eight and 10 millimeters. The rate uh, that I evaluate is 0 0.9 pints and 3.5 pints, okay. The maximum dose of the, resist, the resistor is 1.75. Okay, in this case, we apply it the double of the, uh, the, the normal rate. Okay, the, the, we apply it the double uh, uh, of those of the registry rate. And this is the result. Okay, the, here in, in the axis of the X is the, 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 the thinning rate. And this is the number of fruits on uh, fruit set. And when increase the thinning rate, the, the, the number of fruits is lower and the fruit set is lower. At the end, uh, the efficiency of metamitron is higher, okay? When we increase the rate, the efficiency of metamitron is higher, okay? But uh, the fruit weight, the average of fruit diameter and red blue area, all these parameters are related with, with, with the crop load, okay? With higher crop load, the, all these parameters is lower, Okay, but when increase the rate of metamitron, the efficiency uh, of thinning is higher. At the end, the fruit weight, the fruit diameter, and red blue area is higher because we had higher crop uh, lower crop loads. Okay, the second part of these studies is in, in New York State. And during 2015 and 2018, during four years, uh, Cornell evaluate uh, uh, the efficiency of metamitron in different rates, in rates between one pine and, and 2.7 pines. Okay. Uh, they evaluate uh, into, into timing in petal fall and 12 millimeter spray in Gala. Okay. And the result, 
is the same. Uh, one increase the rate, the efficiency of metamitron is higher because the number of fruits in these two timing was lower. It's important to say that if you see the timing, the 12 millimeters sprite, there are, there are efficiencies or there are uh, number of fruits between 100 and 200, okay? With in, in petal fall, never arrived at this efficiency. At the end, the efficiency at 12 millimeter is higher. The result go in the same line that I explained before that the maximum efficiency of metamitron is in this, in this fruit size. And the second experiment, it was in 2021 in Sutango, we supply through rates between uh, 1.5 pints and 2.5 pints. And the result is the same. Okay, this is the number of fruits per tree when you press the red, the, the number of fruits is lower and the fruit set show the same result. Okay, at the end, we have a, a linear dose effect uh, with this product when you increase the red and the efficiency is higher. Okay, the last conclusion is a linear dose effect was observed with increased metamitron dose resulting a greater efficiency of the thing. Okay, this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Luis. I know I'm I'm very excited for us to get Brevis fully labeled so that we can can do a bit more of it commercially. So thank you. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat box, but again, uh, if you do have questions, please go ahead and, and type those in there, and, and we'll be able to address them. Uh, we do have a question, Luis. Do you happen to know when Brevis is going to be labeled commercially in the United States? I don't know. This is a question for Adama. <laughs> uh, I think maybe in two or three years. I think in New York State this year there are a special, I'm not sure, uh, but maybe there are permission for a spray in a single growers, but I don't know exactly when or when will arrive. The All right. <laughs> Thanks, Luis. I remember when, when yeah. I was talking with, with their rep too, it, it sounded like it was sort of in that two to three year timeline. So that 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 sounds right to me. So hopefully, okay. hopefully soon. All right, thank you, Luis. So I would like to invite our last speaker of the day, who's gonna be talking about her ACC trials on apple and peach. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Anna Wallace. She's an extension educator with Michigan State University Extension. She recently earned her PhD in plant pathology at Cornell with her work on fire blight and is now investigating various PGRs in her new role in Michigan. So thank you, Anna. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of my work here today. Um, yeah, I'm excited because of my history with Cornell to be a part of this meeting. Um, so the work that I'm going to present today has to do with ACC and the work that I've been doing here over the past year um, on both apples and peaches in Michigan. So this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with Bill Schwalier and Amy Irish Brown, who many of you probably know well for all of the work that they've done on PGRs over the past many years. Phil recently retired um, and I am currently filling his position or trying to. And we have two fantastic technicians, Denise Ruersma and Gail, or Peach Byler, we call her, and um, they've been integral to these projects. Also, I work with Todd Einhorn, who is a professor in horticulture at MSU, um, our fruit physiologist. So this is not a project that I've been working on alone. Um, so for those of you that don't know where I'm located, uh, I am just north of Grand Rapids here in what we call Fruit Ridge, and this is where about, well, much more than half of the production of apples is in Michigan. Um, and so a lot of Michigan is known for having very sandy soils, but this is actually a topographic feature, the ridge that is a little bit higher in elevation and heavier soil, so it's an ideal production area for um, apples, and so that's primarily in Kent County. Um, but other regions of the state also have very diverse fruit production. And Polly covered really thoroughly what ACC is, so I'm not going to cover any of this in detail, especially since you guys are sticking around to the end of the day on Friday. Um, so to jump right into the trials that I'd like to share with you, first I'll talk about ACC for thinning apples and the objectives that we were interested in covering had to do with how effective ACC was as a late season thinner, um, but also if it can be used as an earlier season thinner. 
So during that 10 to 12 millimeter window per millimeter. So in this year, um, the trials that we conducted were all in the Brookfield Gala on G11 uh, that were planted in 2017 to a tall spindle system um, or a super spindle system, excuse me. Um, and these were all conducted using an air blast application calibrated to 100 gallons per acre. Uh, and we did the completely randomized design with all of the different treatments. To give you an idea of what the thinning conditions were in um, our region this year, uh, you can see we had a pretty significant carbohydrate deficit during the eight to 10 millimeter window um, due to some really warm conditions. And then during the later um, rescue thinning period, we had a, a little bit um, cooler weather and had a little bit of a surplus. So that was going to affect our thinning efficacy. And so the first trial results that I'll show you, we evaluated several different treatments at the eight to 10 millimeter window. Um, so one application was made for each of these treatments and it was um, Maxwell and seven as a, a, a grower standard and then ACC or Maxwell in combination or with other materials. And so you can see the results that we had from this trial included um, our untreated check on the left here compared to our standard Max and 7 which was fairly close to our crop load and target that is this dashed line. Um, and then all of the other treatments were not significantly different than each other and provided some thinning, but was not, uh, not significantly different than our untreated control. And partly this is because we had a number of frost events this year, and so we expected to have very low number of fruit. So we were cautious during our thinning um, and only used this one application at eight to 10 millimeters. Uh, but we ended up having a really heavy crop load. And so I think that contributed to the lack of difference between treatments. But overall, what we saw was some thinning with these combinations at eight to 10 millimeters. And we think they would obviously be better in combination with earlier applications um, as part of a complete program, as opposed to standing alone, which is not how we operate in general thinning practices anyway. Uh, we did see some differences in fruit weight, but that was always correlated with the amount of thinning. Um, we saw a minor amount of cytotoxicity, so I'm showing you uh, what we observed uh, for the different treatments. There was never a significant difference in our cytotoxicity um, evaluation. And generally what we saw was just a little bit of yellowing in the spur leaves in the interior of the canopy. And so we don't believe that that was um, meaningful in any way. Uh, although it can look like you have some yellowing of foliage, we don't think that that's having a significant negative impact. Um, so this is a trial that Phil conducted in 2020, uh, looking at ACC in that 20 millimeter window. And so first I'm just showing you the untreated control compared to the hand thinned check. Um, and you can see the hand thinned check was pretty close to his target crop load and those blue bars. And then the red dots are showing the average fruit weight. So again, the average fruit weight in this experiment always correlated with the amount of thinning. And so these were some of the grower standards. We he applied NAA in seven or Maxil at seven at petal fall. Um, or he did two sprays of NAA and seven at petal fall and at 10 millimeters. And you can see the standalone treatments didn't provide very much thinning um, and two applications over thinned quite a bit. And then he looked at three different applications or treatments of ACC in that 20 millimeter window. Um, the standalone treatment on the left here didn't provide very much thinning alone either. Uh, but when that was combined with the thinning application made at petal fall, either NA and seven or max cell and seven, it was pretty close to the target crop. So this is just evidence that ACC in that 20 millimeter window isn't gonna provide very much thinning alone, but when you use it in combination with an earlier thinning application as part of a complete program, it's um, a very effective thinner. Uh, and we're seeing more thinning with ACC than max cell seven alone or NA and seven alone. So it's looking like a very promising product um, for a season long thinning program. Um, and just some, some conclusions that I already uh, elaborated on, um, greater thinning at the 20 millimeter window, we think that's really where that's gonna, this 
product is going to fit for apple thinning. Um, and minimal phytotoxicity, although it is evident we don't think it's um, a significant uh, problem or concern. Uh, and so we're going to continue to look at this material at different timings and in different combinations with other thinning materials. So the second part of my talk is looking at ACC and peaches and just some work that we did over the past year. Um, so for this work, we set up some trials in two commercial orchards, uh, and we looked at only three different treatments. We looked at an untreated control, and then either one or two applications of ACC at 20% bloom, and then about four days later at 100% bloom. And so these orchards were located in Sparta and Kent City, which are both on um, Peach Ridge or Apple Ridge, Fruit Ridge uh, here in Kent County. Um, and these were also done as an air blast trial, calibrated to 100 gallon tank, or calibrated to 100 gallons per acre. Um, and the application rate was 300 parts per million. And so we observed significant senescence about four days after the first ACC treatment as just some browning of flowers. Um, and then there was a pretty dramatic difference in the number of fruit per treatment. So just walking down these rows, it was very evident that we were having significant thinning effect. Um, and we evaluated this about a month after, um, after the thinning treatments were conducted. So beforehand thinning took place, uh, but after we thought uh, natural fruit drop had concluded. Uh, we saw some minimal phytotoxicity. There was a little bit of yellowing of leaves, but like Polly said, we think it's a pretty safe material, and that was true in this trial. Um, I was unable to collect thinning data or phytotoxicity data in this trial because it happened right around the time I was busy with some apple work, but um, we hope to continue doing that work in the future. And so this is just to show us um, about one month after the treatment, you can see there is a lot of great green foliage on the trees, but a really significant difference in the number of fruit on the trees. So the data is looking at the thinning effects, um, looking at the graph on the right, this is just PF Lucky 13. We did this in four different cultivars on the first commercial orchard. Uh, and you can see there was a really nice dose effect for the number of treatments that were applied and the amount of thinning. And then we also did that in three other cultivars, so PF23, All Star, and Starfire, and we had a similar rate effect um, or dose effect with the number of treatments that were applied. In the second orchard, we looked at a number of at three different cultivars, Bright Star, All Star, and Red Haven. And again, we saw a similar effect with the untreated compared to one or two applications of ACC. We saw a nice step down in the amount of thinning. Um, and this is measured as fruit per bud. And that was true for all three cultures. The other thing that I did was evaluate hand thinning time in these two different orchards. So um, I counted that, or I, I spent a whole day with each, with a, um, I spent a whole day in each orchard following crews around and counting how long it took them to thin one tree and calculating an average time. Um, in orchard one, uh, I followed a crew of two and I evaluated thinning for the whole tree and I also looked at top and bottom separately. And this is because um, we were seeing more thinning in the bottom of the tree instead of the top of the tree. And I was just interested in whether uh, there was a difference in the hand thinning time. And so what we found was there was um, similar to the thinning effects of reduction in hand thinning time per tree with an increased rate. Um, there wasn't so much difference in the tops and the bottoms in the second and third bar in each of these groups, um, but that could be related to climbing up down ladders and things like that as well. And then in the second orchard, I followed two different crews and I only evaluated untreated and two applications of ACC. Um, but again, you can see a noticeable reduction in the amount of time required for hand thinning. Um, the workers were actually complaining there was too much foliage. They couldn't find the fruit in a lot of cases. And I think that's a good sign that it did a, a great job thinning. And overall, in both of these orchards, we had about half the amount of time required for hand thinning with two applications of ACC. Uh, this is an additional trial that was conducted at another location. So 
we have recently um, a new research station in West Central Michigan. So this is in Hart. It's about two hours north of where I'm located. Uh, and John Baker conducted this trial in um, some processing peaches in Venture. It's an older block this year. And so this is just his replicated trial design looking at similar treatments. Um, the control compared to if ECC applied it at pink once or at pink and then again at 30% bloom. And so he did some pre-thinning evaluations where they thinned the trees and collected the fruit that were thinned. Um, and so he weighed the total, he counted the total number of fruit and, that were thinned and then weighed and counted those fruit um, in order to see how much fruit was required to be hand thinned. And so the results of that work, he showed that there was a really huge reduction in the amount of fruit that was thinned per tree with a greater application of ACC. He did some pre-harvest evaluations as well. Um, and so in the control, he found there were smaller than average uh, fruit size um, and then a pretty normal maturity window. Um, but in the ACC uh, applications, there were significantly fewer fruit, which is great, resulting in much larger fruit. Um, and then the, the harvest maturity window was advanced by about a week. Some other observations from both of our work is there was like slightly earlier ripening and potentially a compressed harvest window. So this is something that we want to continue looking at. Another um, observation that we made, I won't say that this is a concern, is that there were split pits in these trials, but I think that might be more related to variety susceptibility. It's something that we want to continue to look at. Um, I know for sure one of the varieties that we evaluated, the grower actually took out after the season because it's so prone to split fits. So just something to be uh, looking at. So overall, we're very excited. Um, every grower that I work with that is uh, growing peaches is interested in applying more ACC to their orchard um, because they see the utility of the product. It's very exciting to be a part of. Um, and as Pollyanna said, the 2022 availability is limited. I think they're calling it a grower experience that um, is available just for um, certain growers and research. Um, so we're gonna continue research on this in the future, looking at different rates and timings. Um, we're interested in how different environmental conditions are affecting the thinner, both in peaches and apples, and then how it's affecting the harvest window and the fruit quality. So we wanna do more harvest evaluations this year. So thank you again, Mike, for including me in this in this uh, program. And I just want to say thank you to all of our collaborators. We've had some great um, grower collaborators that we couldn't do this work without. And I appreciate your time. If there's time, I take questions, or I think that you're going to open up the floor for all of the speakers to take some questions. Yep. Thanks so much, Anna. Really appreciate it. Uh, and I know a, a couple of of New York peach growers that are really excited to get this material. So we're looking forward to hopefully getting our hands on it, I, I suppose, in 2023 then. So thank you. It's, it's great to see such promising results with it. So with that, um, as Anne alluded to, that does bring us to the end of our program. So if anybody does have questions for Anna or any of our other speakers throughout this entire program, now is the time to go ahead and type those into the chat box. I see we, we did plan to, to end at, at 4.45 and we're, we're planning to have 10 minutes for Q&A, but um, you know, I think we can certainly stay on till about 4.50 if, if questions are coming in. And if not, um, since it is a Friday afternoon, we, we won't hold you to, to here too long, uh, but let's see if there's any questions coming in. And again, it could be for any of our, our speakers today at this point. We have a question coming in. Will Exceed get a cherry label, do you think? I don't know if Anna or, yeah. or Polly want to address that. So we looked into thinning um, for cherries and uh, we didn't see consistency in the results. So we saw some thinning, some years we didn't see, we saw some over thin. So we're gonna, uh, we're not going to do any work this year on cherries, but we're going to continue next year. We have some priority to do this year to give us to give. And then next year, we're going to continue doing the work on cherries. Maybe. 
All right, thank you, Polly. So I don't see any other questions coming in, but I'll, I'll wait a, a little bit here just in case someone's typing one out. Maybe while we wait, I'll ask Polly <laughs> not to give away any of your secrets, but should we expect anything else coming out of the product pipeline in the, the next few years? Or do you think you have your hands full with ACC at this point? Well, maybe I cannot tell you anything, but there's another one coming. <laughs> Well, it's at very early stage. So actually, we uh, we were looking at how long it takes to register a PGR. So we've been registering a new PGR every 10 years. So got to wait another 10 years now. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's good. I'm, I'm pretty young in my career then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. And I do understand that we are at at 4.45 on a Friday, so people are probably looking to get their weekend started. So with that, um, I would just like to thank all of our speakers for joining us today. I really enjoyed hearing a bit about what everyone's doing. Um, so, so thank you all again, and thank you to all of, all of you for joining us today. Again, we do have this recorded, so expect this to go out probably early next week, we'll, we'll get this up on our YouTube page and I'll also send out a link in an email to you all. And we'll also make slides available in PDF and I'll include those in the email as speakers allow me to. So thanks again and have a great weekend and we'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>